I've got some new tour dates to tell you about. I will be back in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Fox Theater. I loved it so much. I'll be there on April 4th. Tickets go on sale this week. Get yours early with code RATKING starting Wednesday, January 10th at 10 a.m. local time. We also have tickets remaining in Brisbane, um, in the Australia, Sydney, uh, in the Australia as well, Charlottesville, State College, Amherst, all of those available at theovon.com slash T-O-U-R. And make sure you get your tickets through there. If you're looking at some ticket that's an insane price, $500,000, then you're on some weird site. And that's that's your issue. Um, but yeah, if tickets are too expensive for you at whatever's remaining or on, se- or on a secondary site, just wait. We'll come back through. I don't want you blowing your bank out, man. Uh, thank you guys for the support. Today's guest is uh, the man. That's one way to put it. He's the number one life strategist uh, on the globe, on earth. Um, he's a philanthropist. He's an entrepreneur. He's a best-selling author. Um, it, there's, uh, there's nothing really that he hasn't done. He is an inspiration to many. He's worked with some of the most intriguing and successful people on earth um, as an advisor to them. Uh, I feel lucky to get to sit down with him and spend some time. Today's guest is Mr. Tony Robbins. Yeah, man. Thanks so much, dude. Really, really cool. Good to be with you. Yeah, you too, man. And so many of my friends are fans of yours, and that's how I became a fan. I got to listen to you and laugh my tail off here. Thanks. You really bring a different color to things. It's fantastic. Yeah, I don't know what we're doing a lot of times. You <laughs> well, know? That's, you, that's when you do your best, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think it, just it is. Flows. It just flows. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I guess it is, man. Yeah, I, that's true, actually. Yeah. It's weird how much you can kind of plan and then... But if you can show up with a level of not unplanned kind yeah. of like spontaneous is always much more funny and, and much more powerful, I think. Yeah. 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 I guess you because you probably because you do so many things. I mean, even after just seeing and hearing a lot about you online and and just over the years, you do so many things to try and fine tune yourself. Right. Would you, is that a safe, safe way to say that? Yeah. I know. And I have certain fundamentals that I want to cover. But every time you enter an audience and you got 15,000 people. You know, and you got to hold them for 12 hours a day for five or six days when they wouldn't usually sit for, you know, a 30 minute you know, video or three hour yeah. movie. So you got to really be able to adapt and feel what's there just like you and adapt. And, and it's got to be funny. I mean, if all you do is get up and talk for 12 hours, you want to kill yourself, right? So yeah. you got to make people laugh and you got to move them. You got to produce all those things. Cause you know, time is so relative. Like how long is a long time? Some people think, well, you know, a thousand years. Some people think two minutes, right? So a long time is when you're not enjoying yourself. You know, a minute feels like eternity. Oh, when you're yeah, in, it's the but, worst, if you're, but if you're fully engaged and you're enjoying everything, like 12 hours goes like that. Yeah. So it's, it's fun to see the impact you can have with people when you're willing to adapt. It was the same every time also. You know, I'd be bored out of my mind. Just At like your live events, you mean? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, I mean, it's definitely remarkable. Um, yeah, I think I was thinking about like, like tuning, like more just like in your regular life and like your uh, being ready for the day. Like, yes. how, what is that tuning like for you? Cause that's a constant, like that, that's always evolving. Like every couple of months now we hear about some new thing or some yeah. new method or somebody's, you know, people are hiding underground for two hours or whatever. <laughs> people are, you know, there's people like who, you know, won't, you know, won't let their shadow outside for a month and it's <laughs> supposed to help them process limp or whatever, you know? So there's, there's so many things. And, um, what are some things that, that are you, that you do or that, that really make you feel, like, uh, that didn't feel like snake oil kind of, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, some things I do, I've been doing for like 20 years. Like, you know, I start every day in a cold plunge. Yeah. Now it's very popular, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ice bath and so forth, but I don't, there's never a day I look forward to it. Theo. I don't yeah. wake up and go, I can't wait to freeze my ass off. But I, to me, it's a discipline. It's like training my mind besides the physical benefit. You know, it doesn't feel good when you go in, but you feel amazing coming oh, out because yeah, your brother. entire body gets flooded, right? You, oh, your yeah. limp, your blood moves. 
But going in, it's like, I don't negotiate with myself. I don't go, oh, let me see if I'm ready. It's like, I've trained my brain. I say, go, we go. And my home in Sun Valley, I, I walk through the snow and get in the river. Yeah. You know, and that's like, you know, 41 degrees. And I mean, it's, it's intense. But when you train your brain that when I say, go, go, no negotiation, then that shows up in every other part of your life. So I do that. I, you know, I work out every day, obviously. I do a 10 minute process. It's, a, it's not really a meditation because, I'm not good at not thinking, and I don't know many people are that have no thoughts, but I, I do a way to kind of condition my nervous system and my mind. It's really simple. I do these three pieces, uh, three minutes each. It's only 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So if I said 20 minutes, people say I don't have time, but 10, if you don't have 10 minutes for your life, you don't have a life, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I just do three minutes of what are the emotions that mess people up in their relationship or their business? It's usually anger or fear, some derivative of those two. So the antidote to those is gratitude. You can't be angry and grateful simultaneously. Right. You can't be fearful and grateful simultaneously. So I train my nervous system by starting every morning. I do this process to change my body. It's a breathing process. And then I think of one at a time, a minute each, I see and feel something in my life that I'm really grateful for. Wow. I do little things and big things. So you don't have to have a giant thing to be grateful. Yeah. And it's real. It's not like I'm seeing it over there. It's like I'm experiencing it. So it changes your biochemistry. So when you say and experience it, not to interrupt you. Yeah, no, but go I, for it. Interrupt me as I much as you want. Please. But no, I just want, because I'll forget what the question is. If, <laughs> that's the only reason. It's like, no it's like a go desperation. For it. Go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so in that moment, like, because I know what you're talking about, I'll make a gratitude list, right? But yeah. sometimes it's like I'm just writing the things down and there's no real connection. Yeah. And that, that won't do much. And right? I know it won't do it. It's like, yeah. I know this isn't going to help. At least I'm doing the practice. That's but nice. I know it's not going to have like a, I, I can tell even right now, it's not going to help me that much. Yeah. So what are you saying that I that, that I'm saying I close do? my eyes. And it, you know, sometimes if I said, think of a time when you rode a roller coaster and you remember it over there, like see it over there, mm -hmm. that's called disassociated. But if I get you to imagine being in the front seat and you might tell me, oh, it was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. But if I get you to go back to actually the moment when you're coming over the edge, oh. And then, yeah, you see even right now, you can I see, about, oh, you know, so that's what I do with the gratitude. I get in my body as if I was then see it and feel it and experience it. Yeah. And that creates a biochemical change in your body as opposed to a thought. A thought's not enough, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And you do three of those. And then I have three minutes of kind of a cleansing of my body that I do mentally and, and a kind of a prayer for others. And then I do three minutes of what I call, you know, three to thrive. I think of three things I want to make happen, mm -hmm. outcomes, results. And I don't sit there and beg for them or pray for them. I see them as done. I feel them. I celebrate them as done. Because when your subconscious mind believes it's done, it makes it happen. So it's kind of programming it. And the whole thing only takes 10 minutes. Mm. If anybody wants to do it, they can go to TonyRobbins.com forward slash priming. There's no cost for it. And it shows you how to do it. But we do it with, you know, 20,000 people in a stadium yeah, yeah. and the energy that you have at the end, that's amazing. Cause otherwise you wake up and what do you have? The first thing is your phone and your oh. phone has a mixture of things really, you know, if you have, you know, like you do a lot of responsibilities and companies and these, I look at my fingers. Oh, that's, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, you, you're not in control of your life. So I, I set my life first. I prime. What I mean by priming is priming is a psychological principle. A lot of times when people feel, think something think, Oh, that's my thought, but it's been primed by something in the environment. I gotta give you an interesting study. They did this at Harvard. They took uh, men and women, trained them as actors. Uh -huh. They went out and did this very simple thing. They would go out to people and yeah. have a cup of coffee mm -hmm. and they rehearse doing it the exact way every time. And they walk up to you. And you're these are actors doing it. Yeah, they're doing it. The okay. mall or someplace else, they see you sitting there and go, the excuse, mall, yeah. they go, excuse me, or university campus, and they're holding the coffee. And they go, could you hold this for a second? And they don't ask. They put it in your hand and they look down. So 90% of people take it. And they reach in their pocket, did something with their phone. Thanks so much. That's it. And walk away. Well, half those people they did that with had hot coffee. The other half had cold iced coffee. So then 15 minutes later, approximately 15 to 20 minutes later, somebody comes by and they have this little sheet, you know, this clipboard. And they say, hey, I've got $20. If you'll give me 60 seconds of your time, would you take 20 seconds to read this little paragraph of a story? And then tell me afterwards, I have two questions. So they read the story and they say, okay, tell me what was this person like? How would you describe this character? Well, the person that the coffee person, you mean? The, no, the, the, they don't remember oh, that the person. Story. It's been gone. From the story. Now it's a new person. Okay. 20 bucks. Most people do it. 20 mm -hmm. bucks for a minute. Okay, yeah. I'll do it. Some people say, I don't need the 20 bucks. I'll just answer your question. Oh, God. They read this huh? little story. It's Fancy. the same, same story for everybody. Yeah. And then they asked him afterwards, how would you describe the main character? The people that got hot coffee, 81% of them say the person is warm and generous. When they give them the iced coffee, they don't even know it affected them. 80%, 1% difference is variable, will say the person is cold or uncaring. No way. Same that story. True? That's absolutely true. Oh my gosh. You can, do a, you can do this with creativity. If I said to you, 
make, if I talk to an audience, I'll say, make the sound of what you think of when you think of Microsoft and you get, uh, make the sound of Apple, uh, right? That's a trillion dollar difference in people's response. So they've done creativity tests. Well, they'll have people watch a 30 second Apple commercial or just look at the Apple logo mm -hmm. and then look at an IBM commercial or an IBM logo. 20% higher score on a creativity test they take right after that for those who just looked at the Apple commercial. That's it. So we can be influenced so powerfully. So I decide I wanna advertise in my own mind. I'm not gonna have somebody else take control. And so I prime myself every day. I prime my brain so it's in a grateful state. It's an anticipatory state. It's a moving state. Because otherwise, you get whatever you feel like. And I don't know about you. There are days I wake up. I don't know what city I'm in. You know, oh, yeah. My body's gone. I've got three hours sleep. I'm in a time zone. So if I didn't reset, yeah. then it'd be fake. I'd be getting up trying to talk to people. And I'm not really. You can't move people if you're not moved. You can't touch people if you're not touched. You can't mm. make people laugh if it doesn't make you laugh, right? You know? Yeah, that's true. That's so, really true. So I try to make sure I'm in that place wow. every single day. And then when you do it every day, it trains your nervous system to look for things to be grateful for. Right. Then your mind starts to become conditioned because most people- Is that true? It, that's absolutely true. If you don't, they're just habits, right? So if you don't use your mind, your mind will use you. It's like technology, wow. right? If, if you use technology to do amazing things, or you can let your technology start using you where your oh, whole life yeah. is controlled you can be by it. Gambling on your phone, even. Yeah, for sure. And that's just, sure. you could be doing anything. God, it's upsetting. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've, yeah, I've been obviously, <laughs> I have blockers on my phone now because obviously I can't, you know, whatever. But, um, but that's amazing. No, that's something I don't, that we don't think about a lot is like, instead of just looking at the world, why don't you, clean the weapon that you're looking at the world with. You, you got know? it, you got um, it. Because people, think of it this way, Theo, people don't experience life. They experience the life they focus on. Right. So right now, there's a, if you're happy, you are deleting all the things you could be pissed off about or frustrated or worried about in the world. Yeah. If you're unhappy, you're deleting all the things that are great in your life. Wow. And our brains delete and they distort and they generalize. So if you don't direct it, you get whatever shows up. What's wrong is always available. What's wrong in the world, it's always available. What's right is also available. It's just which one you pick. Mm -hmm. And it isn't about positive thinking, because I, I, I've never been into positive thinking. People think I, that's what I do, it's not. I believe in intelligence. And so when you're in a lousy state of mind, you treat people poorly, you don't perform at the highest level, you're not happy. Yeah. When you're in a great state of mind, you treat people better, perform at a different place, and it's one of the reasons the humor is so valuable. Yeah. It changes people's state. And then, you know, all of a sudden they're in a different place. They respond in a different place when they're laughing than when they're pissed off. Yeah. So why not train yourself to do that? You've trained mm. yourself to find what's entertaining or funny in just about anything. It's what makes you as good as you are in that area. You have developed patterns of how to do it. You may not even be conscious of them all. Yeah, I don't think I was, con I don't think there are conscious patterns, but no, I think, but you're yeah, sometimes the lament, sometimes, yeah, the best part is when my brain will make me laugh and I didn't even have anything to do, you know, yeah, like, yeah. cause after a while, subconscious. yeah, you're like, yeah. and you're like, I'll, sometimes I'll just bust out laughing. I'll be like, thank you so much. Like, <laughs> like my brain, like, just like does like a little joke for me or something. Yeah. Um, and this, this goes right into something I was thinking about since it's like the new year, you know, and happy new year yes. to you. Thank you and, too. um, and yeah, cause people so often say like new year's resolution or they're like, but that doesn't really that's kind of like a one and done. It feels almost outdated, that idea. But how do you, I guess, and you just kind of answered, I guess, like how we change our perspective. So like, so we change our attitude, you know, that's really what you need to have a new experience. Yeah, you, you, there's three decisions you're making every moment you're alive. Your audience can test this out. The first one is what are you going to focus on? Now, when I say you make these decisions, Theo, mm -hmm. I don't mean you're making them all consciously, right? So whatever you focus on, that's what you feel. If you're supposed to meet your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whoever at seven o'clock, you get there at seven, they're not there. Some people are pissed off. Some people are worried. It's the same event. If it's 7.30 and they're not there, they've not called, they've not text. Now, what are you feeling? Some people go, I'm really pissed off. I'm really worried. I'm really it's, single. You know, <laughs> I'm really single. I'm, it's 8.30, I haven't showed up. I'm full. I didn't wait for the bastard. <laughs> you know? But the point is, whether you're angry or whether you're worried had nothing to do with the event. It's the habits of your mind. Mm. The person who's worried thinks, well, oh, maybe they're in a car accident. The person's pissed off, they did it again. So the first decision you make is what are you gonna focus on? And most people have patterns of focus. Yeah, so, yeah, So there's sure. three I'll give you, your audience can test out. Do you tend to focus more on what you have or what's missing? What, what's missing? One? Yeah. Do you tend to focus more on what you can control or what you can't control? Probably what I can control because, but it's out of desperation because I feel like I have to control everything. Well, that's not a bad thing. You can't control everything, right? It's an illusion, but you can influence so much. You can control everything in you. Okay. And then the third one, do you tend to tend focus more on the past, the present, or the future? The past. Yeah. So 
those three patterns, if you do all three of them, if you constantly look at what's missing, it's hard to ever stay fulfilled or happy. Yeah. So you have to always do something to try to make yourself happy because you're always noticing what's missing. That's just where your focus goes. There's always something missing. There's always something that's not missing. There's always something beautiful. If you focus on what you have, mm -hmm. you're gonna be more fulfilled. Second one, if you focus on what you can control what you do, it's why you have your own business, it's why who you are. But a lot of people focus on what they can't control. It's overwhelming, they're stressed out, they think of all those things. So if you constantly focus on what's missing you can't control and the past, which you can't change, mm -hmm. what that makes is either angry or sad or frustrated or depressed. I've, you see people all the time that come to me, you know, groups, I just did this thing for Stanford where they, two years ago and everybody's in COVID, they came to me because two of their professors came to my seminar for five days, both were, uh, you know, clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. They came back with no depression symptoms. They said, you know, how do you do this? I mean, do you have any data? I said, well, I got millions of people that <laughs> in my programs, you know. They go, no, like scientific data. I said, well, you wanna do a test? They said, sure. I said, what do you wanna test on? And they said, depression. And I said, well, I already know what triggers that for anybody. You can give them drugs all day long. All Prozac and Zoloft does is numb things. But yeah, I, said, I just got off of mine. Oh, really? good for you. Yeah, I'm like 17 days off right now. So awesome. Well, let's see how it goes. Uh, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> but, but your two patterns that you just did, yeah. constantly focus what's missing and the past will make it a little harder for you to, to be happy on a long-term basis. Right. You crack yourself up, so in the moments you change your state. But if you want a long-term change, all you'd have to do is change the habit. It's just a habit. Mm -hmm. Focusing on what you do have, like your life is magnificent. Yeah, yeah, I gotta. I try a lot. I just have to make sure I do. Well, it has to get conditioned. Right. And then the second one, so it's auto, so you don't have to think about it. If you have right. to think about it, it doesn't work, right? Because by that time, it's too late. And then the second one is focusing on what you can control, you already do. But the past versus the present and the future, enjoying the present and building the future. Just that little pattern changed somebody's life. Do you know how many people are on Prozac and Zoloft? I'll ask in an audience. I got 15, 20,000 people. I say, how many of you know someone? who's on antidepressants and they're still depressed. And 95% of the room raises their hand. And the reason is because those drugs numb you, but they don't charge the cause. As long as you constantly focus on what's missing from my life and constantly look at the past, which you yeah. can't control. And if you're on top of it, you're focused on you know what you can't control. Well, that's why I got off. Cause I, I couldn't Smart. have any feelings. I was trying to like be in relationships and stuff. And it's like, girls would be like, do you like me? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I would literally have to look at like history of stuff. Like, it's almost like I would have to look at my own past for clues, right? Yeah. Like on how I felt. And so. Because you're being altered, right? You're being altered and not. Yeah, a good it was just too, it was too hard to get like a real feeling out of myself. And so I was like, man, I got to have some feelings or I'm not going to be able to make some choices for myself. Good for you. That's and really so, awesome. It's but I want you to know, I want you to know how the normal treatment is to put you on antidepressants and therapy or one or the other or both, right? So I asked the guys at Stanford, I said, you wanna study it? Well, what, what are the meta studies? You know, when you have multiple studies, they give you the averages. And they said, well, the meta studies show that 60% of the people who, who take antidepressants, and now they know SSRs RIs don't even work. There was a oh, whole cover of Newsweek. A year ago in <laughs> September, did you, you not know this? Nobody emailed me. I've been taking <laughs> nobody it for 17 <laughs> years. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't go, get go look at September, September of 2022, cover of Newsweek says, meta studies show the SSRIs don't work, but we keep selling them. Right? Yeah, well then what am I doing? <laughs> but watch this, here's the stat. 60% don't improve at all. 40% of the people improve. The average improvement, according to meta studies, is 50%. So they're half as depressed as they were. Now, some people get well, but it's a very small percentage. So I said, you could almost do that with a placebo. And the guy laughed and said, yeah. I said, well, what's the best study you've ever done? The most effective study in science. They said there was a study done at Johns Hopkins about five and a half years, five years ago. It? Pardon me? And who, who what are the- This is from Stanford. That who's was Johns about. Hopkins? Johns Hopkins Hospital has some of the best researchers and so forth. Oh, good. Right? And so they did this study, and here's what they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they gave people psilocybin for a month, yeah. magic mushrooms, mm -hmm. and cognitive therapy. I said, well, you ought to get some change out of that. He goes, yeah, oh, it was yeah. the greatest change they've ever seen in the history of psychiatry. Six weeks after treatment, 53%, mm -hmm. excuse me, 54% of the people had no symptoms of depression. Dude, I, have, I take four stems and a Diet Coke. I'll talk to my sister for an hour, <laughs> you know? So I fully support that, sir. <laughs> But unfortunately, but so, you're saying, so you're saying there's there's new methods. <laughs> there's new methods, but but I said okay, that's amazing. But I said I think we'll do better. But let's see. So they did a group. They modeled that same drug study. Did the same thing with me with no drugs. I put people in this six day seminar I have called Date with Destiny, mm -hmm. and they picked all the people and put them all. Clinically that's your annual seminar, right? Yeah, it's, it's one of the ones here. Yeah. And what was amazing was the results were so profound 
that they didn't want to get canceled, so they sent the data blind out to three other organizations before they published it, and they published it in the journal Psychiatry last year. Results, uh -huh. six weeks later with no drugs, just six days of rewiring your brain, 100% of the people, no depression whatsoever, even better. 17% of the people had suicidal ideation, no suicidal ideation, here's the best part. 11 months later, they followed up. 72% reduction in negative emotions, still no depression, 52% improvement in positive emotions. So when you make a shift in the way you use your brain and it gets conditioned, yeah. and it does get conditioned, so they, they were studying how it works. And yeah, so there's a biochemical key. change that actually happens it's in the perspective, body. Perspective, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, you got to change like, yeah, instead of just being like, I want to have this New Year's resolution, another rule for myself, I need to ch change the ruler. That's good. Right? You got it. You it's got like it. I need to, that's what I need to change. But a lot of people, times we don't even see that we're the ruler. Yeah. yeah that's, a great, that's a great metaphor. This episode is sponsored by Prize Picks. Do you love firing on different sports? Well, Prize Picks is the best daily fantasy sports app for you. That's right. You can fire on all your favorite sports from the NHL, NBA, NFL, UFC and more. Instead of choosing teams, you choose individual players. That's what I like about prize picks. It's novel. It is it has a uniquity to it. You get to you get to choose a player. So you could say Brock Purdy gonna do two touchdowns you and you pick more or less. And that's how you pick them. You could say uh Jordan Matthews gonna have five receptions more or less. And that's how you would pick them. Download the app and use code Theo. Prize Picks will match your deposit up to one hundred dollars. That's right, Prize Picks. Thank you for your support. Blue Chew. Oh man, somebody's allergic to this good wiener, huh? Well, what I'm telling you is, Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. I hate that. You have to lie to people. They're like, what are you getting? And you're like, oh, God, I'm sick. I'm in a wheelchair. And they're like, you're not in a wheelchair. And you're like, you're right. I'm waiting, <laughs> waiting for that wiener dope, baby. You feel me? Blue Chew. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Theo at the checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code Theo. To receive your first month free, visit B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Yeah, it's that's a great, it's a great metaphor. You know, you know, like if you wanted to go do a, I don't know if you're into racing at all, but like a, a Le Mans, a 24 hour race or a Baja 1000, you could have an amazing car, Ferrari, a Mercedes, it's not going to last. You have to re-engineer that car to be able to take on the desert or drive for 24 hours or go to the ones that are in the desert there where they have a pipe yeah. so that when you go down, it's still gonna get the air to the combustion of the engine. Yeah. We have to re-engineer ourselves to the times we're in. We're in a time right now, it feels like winter, where there's more fear than usual. Yeah. It's a season, it'll pass. Do you think that's true? I know it's true, you study history. Think of it this way, there's patterns. Because we see a lot of stuff, right? It, yeah. Like there's so much things going on. It's like, you know, there's all kind. Of, yeah, like we all, it feels like that's true. But well, it's because it's constantly fed to you. Right, by the it's media. hard for me to know if it's true or if it's just Well, it may so be true, much. but you're, it's disproportionate. It's like, you didn't know 30 years ago there was an aircraft crash in some third, four, third world right. country, but now you know it in 10 seconds in your pocket. So, you know, you know when people overreact to something, you've ever gotten pissed off over something little, the reason you overreact yeah. is it's not that moment. It's that it happened again. Right? Yes. Somebody did it again, right? Yeah. So what I call that stacking. So when you stack problem on problem on problem, pretty soon your whole biochemistry, it's hard to get back. Mm. But you can also stack the good. That's why I do the morning priming. So when you stack a good thing on top of a good thing on top of a good thing, your whole biochemistry changes. Oh, yeah. And now you see the world through different eyes. It's, it's not like you're guaranteed to succeed, but your probabilities of pulling it off and enjoying yourself are up about a thousand fold. Oh yeah. And like I'll go to, I go to like AA meetings. I go to recovery meetings. Right. So, um, 
And I notice if I go to a couple in a day, dude, by Friday, I'm a fucking good guy. <laughs> You know, I'm like hugging people. I'm like telling blind people I'm a heel and I can't. But I'll do this for like 30 seconds on them. You know, it's like you just feel like, but you're right. It's a, but it takes me, I have to stack them up. And it's like, that's right. And then it's usually a couple of days later that I even, I'm like, man, why do I feel so great? It's like, oh, because I did this work over the past 10 days, you know. And what you did there were actually, when you really do it strongly like yeah. that, it creates a biochemical change mm. and that creates a new habit in your nervous system. So what notices that in your, in your body? Like your, your, your chemistry in your body actually notices you're doing something different. And uh, wants uh, to uh, here's, like, what they, here's what they found. They, they did my work with a top professor who was highly rated at Stanford. Mm -hmm. He did my work word for word, but he didn't do what I do in an event, which is change your biochemistry, change the way you move, you breathe, your voice, all those things change you. He didn't do that. He just taught it. He got unbelievable results. He's a Tremendous teacher and professor, but mine were 300% greater because right. the biochemical change. So they followed me for three years. They had me wear the $68,000 device that measures heart rate variability. They come during every break and take my saliva. They took my blood, do Sound my like blood pressure. Perverts, Just, huh? <laughs> well, it, was, it was crazy, but they did it on several events over three years. And they found all these wild things like- And is this Stanford did it? Yeah, Stanford did. Okay. And what they found was, and the same group of Stanford in partnership with a group that's worked with like Tom Brady and some of the greatest athletes. And they have this thing they call the um, uh, championship biochemistry. And so if Tom Brady is down in the fourth quarter by 10 points in the Super Bowl, how does that guy come back and win? The reason is because there's a part of him that goes in this state, and I do it every time I get on stage, but my audience does it as well, and they measure it. So what happens is testosterone explodes through my body. That gives you incredible drive and push. And I've got to keep this building going. Imagine, you know, 10,000, 15, yeah. 20,000 people I got to reach the guy at the back for 12 straight hours. The level of intensity is amazing. Playfulness, fun, but it's still intensity. But normally that has a lot of stress with it. My cortisol, which is the stress hormone, mm -hmm. drops through the floor, same as Tom. So what you get is total drive. It doesn't guarantee success, but total drive and not a lot of stress. So you're able to stay centered wow. and go. So my audience though, this is an amazing thing. So they measured me, they found that like, you know, I jump a thousand times in a day on stage and I weigh 290 pounds. So every time I jump and come down, it's four times your body weight. So imagine a thousand pounds of pressure Ooh. a thousand times in a day. Mm -mm. So my bone density is, you look at it, I look like a gorilla underneath oh, it. Oh yeah, you're from, a I've done that. I've done it for like 40 years, right? Yeah. So on the other hand, they also saw that, you know, if you're running with somebody and you can't talk any longer, you've gotten to a four of lactic acid. I'm in an 18 and still speaking. So then they started testing my audiences and they saw it looks like music. When I go into these states, uh -huh. the audience follows me mm. and they measured it. Then when COVID happened, I had all people at home. And so we had people in 195 countries. So they went to people in 40 countries and measured them in real time as we're doing this. Now imagine at a live this seminar- on Zoom? You can, They're measuring them over this? Yeah, I built this, what happened was- Not Zoom, but like a larger scale Zoom. Yeah, 20 okay. foot high LED screens, 0. 0.67 highest resolution. I built a piece so I can bring people up. Eric Yon from Zoom, he built the system. So instead of a thousand people, I could do 25,000. I've done a million and a half people in one wow. seminar to give you an idea for four days. It's been wild. So, but when I built this, I wanted to figure out how to help people. And it's like, could it really work through these screens? It was just out of necessity because every stadium was closed. The governor of California calls me and says, March of 2020, we're about to have an event for 12,500 people. And he goes, oh, yeah. you can only put a hundred people in the stadium. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about, what right? It's not gonna work. About? So I was like, screw you, we'll move to Vegas. They'll never yeah. shut down Vegas. They shut down Vegas like 10 days before we moved 12,500 people there. Then I went, we'll go to Texas. The governor there <laughs> yeah, told me he'll never be. He, he, he bent, right? Yeah, we'll do it we in Joe up. Rogan's yard. <laughs> we did it in movie theaters for, they allowed you to put 10 people and we did 1,250 movie theaters. They shut down the movie theaters. Oh. So I built the studio. So they came and measured the people in all these different countries. Mm -hmm. And what's wild is like, we start here at 10 AM for like a four day seminar. And I had like, I just did one for you know 14,000 people. And we had about a couple thousand people from Australia. We're starting at 10 AM, it's midnight for them. I go 12 to 13 hours. So they go from midnight to one in the afternoon for four straight days and nights. Wow. And we lost 1% of the people. Good day, good so, night. So they have, but their biochemistry is changing the same as mine. And so that's why a year really? later, the changes are still there mm. without them ever interacting with me again. Because people, will this last? Well, that's why Stanford did the study. So that's what the study is. So you're saying, so when the, when the study you were talking about a little bit ago, that was, they went back to people that had gone to your seminar. That's correct. And they, uh, and they measured them. And a year later, you said? 50 something percent of them still had. 
no, reduction of 72% negative emotions, increase of positive emotions, 52%. But wow. now, you know, people, uh, since COVID, we got so used to being home. People are like, why should I have to go to work? I don't want to drive to work. And people at offices want people to come to work. There's all these conflicts, right? And there's a lot more people being able to work at home. But now if you read the studies, people are more unhappy now really? than they were at the peak of COVID because they wanted to be at home, but now they feel isolated, Yeah, you know? And so what they don't understand is the path of least resistance never makes you happy. Mm. It's like, it does, you have to push yourself. When people talk about self-esteem, I hate this term. Like so many kids were taught to get a participation trophy for something. And they thought, I'm going to build their self-esteem this way. People can tell your whole life you're a piece of crap and your brain can go, screw you, I'll show you. And you become somebody. People your whole life can tell you you're beautiful, you're perfect, you're the best. And you can still not believe them, be depressed about your life and think you're a nobody. Your life self-esteem, your self-esteem, esteem for yourself is earned by you doing something difficult for you. When you do something that's incredibly hard and you push through it, your brain starts so, to have inner pride, not fake ego pride. Right, so you're saying none of that other, so, so that outside of stuff doesn't really matter. Your self-esteem is truly based on your relationship with yourself? Yes, and your ability to grow. I mean, what makes people happy? Progress. If you get some big goal, you've achieved yeah. a lot of them in your life, right? There's one of two responses when you achieve the goal. Yeah. The horrible one is, is this all there is? Which a lot of people do after fighting for a goal, and is this all there is? Oh, yeah. But the, but the other one is, let's say, oh, this is amazing. How long does that amazing feeling of achieving your goal last? Six years? A year? Six months? Six days? Six hours? What would you say? Um, the actual, uh, it, for me, it doesn't last really long. I don't feel that kind of stuff very much. Yeah. Well, and also you'd be numb by those drugs. Right. But for most people, it's somewhere between six hours and probably six weeks. Right. So not super long. No. And so the purpose of life is not just to get your goals, your goals or you're getting what you want. Doesn't make you happy. What makes you happy is who you become in right. pursuit of those goals. So the growth, the progress, even if you don't achieve it yet, but you start losing weight or you start building muscle, or you start making your relationship better, or you start to build a business, the building, the progress is what makes you feel alive because we're all made to either grow or die. Mm. If your relationship's not growing, it's dying. If your business is not growing, it's dying. There's no in-between bullshit. That doesn't work. So, And when you grow, you have something to give. And what makes people fulfilled is growing and giving, sharing it with somebody because there's only so much joy you can have by yourself. You can oh, drugs, yeah. alcohol, entertainment, sex with yourself, whatever. By yourself, oh, there's yeah. a limit to what you can feel. That's why whenever something great happens, most of us want to tell someone, share with somebody we love. Because when you share it, it magnifies it. So that's really what we're trying to show people is how to create that kind of progress. And the problem in New Year's is, as you said, a resolution is just like, what do I want? And they don't think about it in any depth. They say it, and then here's the problem. Yeah. They don't take it beyond that. You have no plan, right? Or it's a very simple plan. Oh, yeah, and by February yeah. 1, by the 1st of February, 95% of those things are already broken. But what they're really oh, missing yeah. is there's I like- I quit my year's resolution in December. You, <laughs> and I, you know? Well, you need a path. And so if you want to make your relationship better, your business better, your life better, it starts with knowing what you want. You got to say, what do I want? Why do I want it? And what kind of person would I have to be to have that stay? Mm. And then you got a second step where you got to tell yourself, find and tell yourself the truth, which is there's a gap between where I am and where I want to be. And don't bullshit yourself. Don't go, I'm, I'm a little overweight or I'm fat because I'm big boned. No, you're fat because you have poor habits, right? That's how it works. Yeah, some people, so, yeah, I remember this. They, people always like, he'll grow out of it. And I'm like, dude, he's 34. <laughs> like my buddy's grandma's like, it's just baby fat. He'll grow out of it. It's like, we all have different, but it's like, he ain't fucking, you know, Ronnie ain't growing because out of it. The that. reason you don't grow out of it is you have to see what's causing you to have that gap. And it's one of only a couple things. Either you got fear, so you're not taking action, or you might have, for example, uh, some limiting beliefs, like it never works, I've tried everything, the good ones are gone, so you don't even begin. Or you might have some emotion gets in the way, or a bad habit, or maybe you're just missing the skill. Like yeah. no one's ever taught you how to make money or grow a business or have a great relationship. So you're learning on the job and it's painful to learn the job. So I've always said, find somebody who's extraordinary at something or many people, figure out what they're doing and do that. It's called modeling. Okay. It's kind of reinventing the wheel. Now you're going to add yourself to it. Yeah. But modeling gives you the pathway to power. And then once you know what you want, why you want it, you're honest about the gap. You come up with a quick plan, not a perfect one, and you start taking action. And then you face your demons. You slay your dragons. What needs to change? Like, okay, I'm never gonna have a relationship if I'm numb all the time. So I gotta, I gotta change this. It's hard, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the hard thing. Right. And when you do the hard thing, you get momentum. And then what was hard becomes easy after mm. a while. And that's really the secret. Dang. Gosh. 
I'm gonna need a calculator to even go through that again, but <laughs> but that's okay, you know. It, well, I, I, but it's a lot of great information, you know. I'm and talking, I, I talk rapidly because I'm so passionate. But you know, you take people through it at an event where they get to process it and take time through it to give you sense. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it, man. I feel like uh, it's nice of you to share that stuff with us because I know it's stuff that you learned over the years, and you know, and it's a lot of value in that, and that you even taking that time to just share that kind of stuff with us. And I know you guys have a program. It's uh, not the date with Destiny, but you guys have another program that you guys do. Oh yeah, that, that program started with uh, COVID because when it, all the whole world shut down, I was like, people need this right now. How do I help? Mm. So I built that studio I told you about. And I was like, okay, why don't I do a, where you don't have travel because they can't. Why don't I make it so there's no money involved and let's just serve as many people as we can. And so I put together a, you know, this three day immersion of just three hours a day, not 12. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's give people an experience where they can really transform. The first year we had a half a million people do it. Last year we had a million and a half people. So we're doing one more this year. On at, the, on at the same time? All at the same time. Wow. In 195 countries, every country in the world. It's so fantastic. So we're doing one this year, January 25th through the 27th. It's absolutely free. There's no charge, it's not partially free. Mm -hmm. Um, and all the people have to do is they go to, it's, it's called Time to Rise. Like it's, it's time to change oh, your life. I see you right here, time to rise, summit.com. Yeah. Uh, January 25th through 27th, and it's free. It's free for anybody who wants to go and they can bring their friends or family. They can do it from their house. They don't have to travel. They can go to the office and do it with people around wow. them. It's, so it's really amazing the results. We have had people change their business, change their relationship, get off drugs. I'll tell you one fun example though. Two years ago, there's this guy that was 735 pounds. He never would have made it to a seminar. Mm -mm. He saw it was free. He's been in bed. He, his brother died. He got addicted to painkillers. Oh, yeah. And then his body just blew up. And then he now had, they told him he have to be on an oxygen mask the rest of his life. He, he couldn't get out of like bed. Like a CPAP machine, you mean? Yeah. Well, it wasn't CPAP. It's pure ongoing oxygen. Oh, right? that's nice. Yeah. And then secondly, he couldn't get out of bed to go to the bathroom. He had to be in bed. He oh. was naked in bed for five years and 730 pounds. So he watches Damn, and I brought him up on screen. Crazy. I didn't know he was there. He raised his hand digitally. So I raised it up and started asking questions. Mm -hmm. So he got so inspired by this. Yeah. He took this little like, like clothes hanger bar and just started doing these little exercises. And over 90 days, I, I told him, I said, you get out of that bed and make it to the restroom. You get out of the restroom and drive a car again, which he hadn't done in seven years. I haven't been out of bed in seven years. And I said, I'll fly you to my Unleash the Power Within event for four days. You'll walk on fire with me and you'll really shift your life, right? He's lost 320 wow. pounds. He, three months later, was out of, the, out of the bed for the first time. He drove a car. He mm. fell in love with this girl. He came to the event, walked on fire. And now he's like, in our, we have a network of people because once you come to this event, there's people all over the world you become friends with. And he's like the superstar of all these people because they can't believe the changes he's made. And it all happened because he never would have come to an event, <clears throat> but because he could do it from oh, home in his bed, it, he could do that. It could reach him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What's something like, I notice like there's been times in my past where it's like, I think I didn't want to change yes. because I wanted to keep having an excuse, right? Like I remember even with smoking, I remember it was like, um, part of me didn't want to stop. There was a part of me I realized that didn't want to stop smoking because I knew if I stopped, I wouldn't. And it wasn't like a, it was kind of a subconscious part of me, yeah. but I knew if I stopped, I would, I wouldn't have something to blame yeah. my inefficiency on or my, what I just wouldn't have something to blame. It's like, it gave me something to blame. Does that make any sense? It does because everything we do, even things that seem stupid or derogatory, we do to meet some needs. And there's only six needs people have. We have a need for comfort or certainty. Mm -hmm. We have a need for variety. We have a need to feel significant, unique, special, important. Everybody has that need. We have a need to feel connection and love. We have a need to grow. We have a need to contribute beyond ourselves. It was just comfort, I think. Yeah. It's the comfort and the certainty of what you know. But there is a fear that everybody has, two fears. Mm -hmm. All human beings at some moment feel that they're not enough. And to feel like you're not enough for someone whose love you crave makes a person crazy inside. Wait, for someone who's what? I didn't hear that right. Somebody who's, whose love you crave. The average person, you don't care. But if it's somebody whose love you really want, Oh yeah. So if you feel like you're not enough, then you feel like you won't be loved. To be worthless and unloved is like psychological death. So people drug themselves, eat, they do anything not to feel that. Well, what are your choices on changing that? Well, you could take on a new project, build a podcast, build a business, do something, but you have to take risks to do that. And risks, you could look like a failure, you could fail, mm. which might look like you're worthless, might look like you're not worthy of love. So subconsciously, we come up with these ways to adapt. So smoking a cigarette, comforts you because when you take that big slow breath in and blow it out nice and slow, it changes the tempo in your body completely. You yeah, go from stress 
the the wild west. Well, you can do that this. same shit without the cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But it, but once you're addicted and it becomes the go-to, some people stop smoking and then they overeat because right. overeating puts all the blood in your stomach and you start to breathe slowly again and feel things and you let go. So you can get certainty and comfort by those ways, or you can yeah. do it by working out and de developing the sense of strength that makes you certain, or you can do the same thing day after day. There's so many ways. There's positive ways and negative ways, but we also need uncertainty. We need variety. If you, if every day you know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, you get bored out of your mind. Oh, so, yeah. But if you have so much variety, you don't know what's going to happen. People freak out. So these needs bounce up against each other. Mm -hmm. And so when people do a behavior like smoking, smoking will give you comfort, certainty, Smoking will give you, in some people's case, variety because you were stressed out. Now you change your state. That feels different. It's called variety. Smoking will give you significance if you think it's cool. Although today it's a little harder to do that because most people think you're an idiot and we put you in a separate room by yourself. Yeah, they think right? you are. Yeah, so, but it used to be, you're I'm cool fisherman. if I smoke. And some people say, you can't make me not smoke. I'm significant, right? For some people, it's a way to connect with other people who smoke, right? Mm -hmm. So when you meet one of those needs, you like it. When you meet two, you're really like, when you meet three, you get addicted. Mm. And you get addicted to positive things. You get addicted to exercise. You get addicted to working out. You get addicted to, you know, growing your business. You, everyone gets addicted to something. If it meets a bunch of your needs, it's amazing. And in a relationship, if a person is certain that you love them, and there's always a surprise, they say, oh, I, I know they love me, and we have so many surprises, we, we have so much variety in our life, and I feel like the most important person, significant, and I feel so much love for them, and we're growing, contributing, I'm leaving. <laughs> Nobody says that. Because yeah. when your needs are met, people stay. Like whenever I work with couples, I work with hundreds of thousands of couples over the years, and they always say, one of them always say, I gave him or her everything, everything except what they needed. Mm. If you gave them what they needed, they wouldn't be leaving. Do you think we're afraid sometimes to say what we need, though, too? Or do you think we even know what we need sometimes? Most people don't. You're absolutely right. Most people not only don't say it, but most people don't even know it. Fuck. They're not even honest with themselves yet. Right? And how do we get that? Because it almost seems like you're just wandering around in the dark if you don't even know that they, there's wiring in the walls, you know, kind yeah. of. Well, there's a, there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, big words, that scientists usually call it the RAS. It determines what you notice. So there are millions of things you could focus on even in this moment. The blood rushing through your ear, the heartbeat, your clothing touching your skin, but you're not thinking about all that, right? Mm -hmm. You delete all that. Mm -hmm. You focus on a small number of things. The RES notices what you are gonna focus on. So if you get clear on what you want, you just say, okay. And by the way, when you say a relationship, people, I don't know what I want. I go, great. Describe the relationship from hell. What do you don't want? Tell me everything you know. I don't want a person like this. I don't wanna be like that. I don't wanna be, and that creates energy. And when they're done with the whole list, then I go right the opposite and you have the relationship from heaven. Or I don't know what I want in a career or job. Right, everything you don't want. Who do you not want to work with? What kind of work you not want to do? People get their energy going with that. They're like, okay, right the opposite. You got the job from heaven. So once you know what it is that you really, really want, mm -hmm. now all you got to do is figure out, okay, what's gotten in the way? What, what do I need to shift? How can I meet my needs in a better way? But that's why we do events like this because telling people just go do that in their normal environment is mm -hmm. difficult. But when you go into total focus, it's like I started to say earlier, if you, if you want to learn a language yeah. and you went to high school, did you, did you take a language, foreign language in high school? Yeah, I took college? Spanish one and Spanish, I think 2000. <laughs> and I don't do know you, what it was. And do you speak Spanish well now? No, our guy didn't even speak. <laughs> our guy was like, he got busted for fraud or something, but uh, I don't know what we learned. Yeah. But I was in there for, I was in there. Yeah, I was in there. But the reason you don't recall it was because it was a little bit at a time. And the brain doesn't learn that way. The brain learns best by immersion. If I said you had the money and the time, I'm not going to teach you Italian. I'm going to drop you in Rome and I'm going to pick you up in 90 days with no teacher. Oh, yeah. And 90 days later, you're speaking Italian because you're in it 24 hours a day, seeing it, feeling, experiencing it. That's how I teach. Yeah. That's why I do 12 hours for four days. Right. That's right? why it's, a, yeah, that's why it's an, it's an intense thing or yeah. it's a um, immersion. Yeah. And that's why it lasts. Because That's why it lasts. Yeah. Ah, wow, man. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. It's, um, I think it's just neat to see that even just using your like seminar as an example that, um, that it takes immersion. It takes real some some real commitment. I mean, even if people are coming for six days, or even if people are, are going to show up for long days on Zoom for four days in a row, it's like whatever it is, it takes some real commitment from ourselves it to does. be able to do those things. So I get a lot of people that get dragged there by somebody, and they're like, "Oh, I'm going to get out of here at the first break." And you know, I remember I had a friend of mine. He's now a friend of mine. He wasn't before, but he came with a, a client and friend of mine who was an NFL player. Mm -hmm. This guy's a billionaire, and he sat down and he saw people clapping and moving and stuff because we move the body. It's not a rah-rah session. 
it's to change your biochemistry. Oh, yeah. There's a science behind it, right? He goes, I'm not going to do this. I'm a billionaire. I don't do this crap, right? And like 30 minutes later, he's jumping. He's going, this is the greatest experience of my life, you know? So sometimes you have to get in the experience to mm -hmm. know what it is. And then when you're in it and it's so enjoyable, because change doesn't have to be painful. It can be enjoyable. But oh, if you yeah. don't know what to do and you just do a little bit at a time, pretty hard to get a real change. But when you go for full immersion, that's what happens. But you know, I still write books and do audios and things like that oh, yeah. because you need immersion and then you need some space repetition. You need to feed the mind on a regular basis. So I like have three things. I go, I want to feed my mind every day. I'm going to need to read or hear an audio for 20, 30 minutes. So I'm constantly growing in some way. I want to do immersion. Even I do this two, three times a year. I'll go places harder to do now because of who I am, but I'll go to the back of the room. I'll get somebody one-on-one -on -one to coach me about something. I did this brain training, for example. It was like, four days and nights to put all these electrodes on your brain to teach you how to go in what's called alpha brain, the part of your brain where happiness is a lot easier, right? So I remember I, it was like 12 hours a day, it was freezing cold in this dark room and you, you could hear these sounds based on how your brain's working and how to retrain your brain. It was hell. And I'm like, who do I got to kill to get out of this? Oh, me. I'm the one to put myself in this thing. Right? Oh. But at the end of four say days. Fidel Castro. It sounded like you were in Guantanamo <laughs> it's, it's, Bay. It felt kind of like that. But after four days, didn't you entertain in Guantanamo Bay? Did I read that you did yeah, some entertainment? Yeah, I, I did some shows in Guantanamo Bay. I heard Bay. that. That was really cool of you to do that. That was man. crazy. I can't believe that. Tell me about that. Well, I'll tell you about it. So first of all, they have a golf course down there, which I didn't even think. You don't think like, because they're in the, tr they're in, it's a tropical area, right? Yeah. So these people, they're down there. It's a beautiful area. Yeah. So you go down. Um, I remember the flight we went on to go down there. You, they have to, you have to fly in like this crazy pattern, I guess, in case like somebody's shooting at you, like you have to be able to evade it. Yeah. So you go in this crazy shape. And then you see like out of the darkness, there's just like this, it looks like a big diamond ring, like, lit up just all the, the outlines of the whole base you yeah, know yeah and so we went there there's all these big lizards not a lot of ladies bring your own lady you know or something <laughs> or bring you know bring a buddy who's willing to you know say he's a lady you know but there's yeah because there's not i think there was i think seven women down there there's like 1100 <laughs> soldiers down there though um, seven women yeah. oh that's a brutal environment <laughs> yeah, so uh, but they are look i'll tell you this the first day you might be like i don't think she's my type by the fourth day you're like that, that is damn hillary Clinton. And, and you get to come home <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 well the four i mean there's a wedding ring shop there and it is, I mean, for the seven women, yeah, there. Oh, they're they all just sitting around all like this. Long. Yeah, it looks like that, that collection you have right there. Dude. They're just, but it is that that part was pretty remarkable. Oh, um, just uh, the beaches they have down there, are real beautiful. You don't hear anything about them though, because they're the ones on the military base. So, did you go to entertain the, the soldiers? Is the soldiers, yeah. yeah. We got to see some of the troop areas and we got to do like some volleyball with some of the prisoners or whatever. Yeah. But, um, some of the prisoners they made them wear like. They couldn't even see while they're doing the volleyball. It was bizarre, but yeah, we got to play volleyball. You play volleyball and you can't see. Nah, that's yeah, that's the that's the rules they made for them. But uh, yeah, and that might be uh, I don't <laughs> know be another form of torture. <laughs> yeah, it may be. I don't know what the 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 act is or the law is, but I'm, hopefully they prevented. Yeah, that shouldn't be allowed. It was semi fun, I guess, but it was yeah. But um, what was it like? Yeah, that was amazing, man. Just to be able to be down there, you know, yeah, that's wild. Just to be able to go do comedy it's there. Good of you to go and do that, brighten people's spirits there. That's it was good. fun. We got to do a bunch. We got to go to go to um, uh, a lot of the Ford operating bases during like the not Kuwait, but maybe Iraq, like after yeah, that, yeah. like um, Bahrain. Yeah. Um, so you're the modern day Bob Hope with a little more color. <laughs> we went out there, dude. I think it's, they, they call me Bobby Hopeless, I think. <laughs> but awesome. we still show up, you know? <laughs> dude, I met a gal, yeah, one time. I mean, I, I got to make out with a girl in a Black Hawk helicopter. <laughs> In the well, I've flown in one, but I haven't made out really? with one. Really? Yes. Uh, look, I've it, flown one. I was a helicopter pilot for it quite was, a while. Yeah, look, she, I mean, <laughs> neither me or her were that handsome. I'll say that. Um, Are you sure it was a her? <laughs> yeah, look, dude, who knows? She was one of the seven. <laughs> dun, 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 who, whatever you got to do, man. It's the troops, you know? That's awesome. Don't ask, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> that's the old, I think that's what they're doing now. Um, but no, well, I know. The reason I mentioned that to you, though, is it was worth it. Because in those four days, I've rewired my brain to have a different level of happiness. So you believe this. You you know this. You've done it so many times that that is the key. That's the thing. It's like you excluded out these other things of like, this is fool's gold. This is fool's gold. Yeah. This is fool's well, gold. I've been through plenty of fool's gold. <laughs> right. That's how you get to the good stuff. Right. That's what I'm but saying. It, but if so you give up, if you give up because something's bullshit, most of it's bullshit. 
But then you find those gems that really work. And when you find the gems that work, then you can mm -hmm. use them for the rest of your life. And then you share them with other people because you can see it really works. You know? yeah. And then you know, then you get the science behind it. But in the past, I've just got people the results. Who, that is the science, right? But it's nice now to have science justifying or being able to show people how powerful it is, how effective it is. But you know, it was in the Journal of Psychiatry last year. And all the people thought this is going to spread like crazy. Not one phone call because they're still selling SSRIs, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good so I mean, the same people come to me that have always come to me, but but nobody from the psychological community on major scale. And they just a big conference and shared the results again, and people were fascinated. And they, this is came up, and asked questions. But there's too much money in the in the. In I don't the, know. It's just even money. It's just habits. This is how they do their their business. It's a business, right? Yeah. For those people. So what so, do you say to somebody like me then? Or I mean, sorry, I'm sitting here, so also me, but. Um, yeah, like who's, because there's ways, like I know once I, right when I weaned off of my medicine, right, I got yeah. to talk, I actually didn't talk to my doctor, but I've gotten off so many times over the years, I felt like I knew what I was doing. I did let my close friends know, hey, I'm all, I'm getting off yeah. my medicine, yeah. let me know if what anything. What were you using at the time? Just uh, Lexapro I've been yeah. taking, yeah. right? And I yeah. said, let me know if anything seems strange or whatever, you know? Yeah. But then I Even started- more strange than usual. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, dude. If I'm just like masturbating at the house, dude, yeah, that's natural. That's right? normal. Dude. Yeah, yeah, that's normal behavior, right? But if I'm pet shopping, <laughs> you know, that's a then you need to call. You somebody. know, you're concerned. Call somebody. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at a dog. That's really scary, <laughs> yeah, 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 dude. Can he fetch? Oh yeah, it's getting weird. Um, but what I'm saying is, uh, yeah. So there, but I started running. Right, I knew. I said, that's, that's great. My biggest thing is, I don't want to lose this bad this this opportunity to see how I'm feeling because I'm not doing my part of taking care of Look, myself. You know, I have so much respect for you doing that. It's right? so hard to do, but you did the right thing, which is what I teach. You got to replace it with something. You don't stop doing something. You replace something else. But what you're replacing it with actually changes your biochemistry. Yeah, and I don't want to run, running, but now I'm starting to freaking like it, dude. Isn't that cool? I met somebody yesterday, and we got some damn Brooks shoes together. <laughs> That's, well, that's a good first step. <laughs> yeah, literally. But you're yeah. right, but you get the runner's high and it's it's a good high for you and you're making, so it's like, it's not about stopping what you're doing. It's about starting something else that's more fulfilling. Mm. Like running, what needs does it meet? Does it make you feel comfortable afterwards? Do you feel certain you're going to feel good when you run? 100%. You have variety when you run. It's like a totally different state. Yeah. Sometimes I'll go around the track this way. Sometimes I'll go around the track this way. Right, okay. And do you have sense of significance? Like, shit, I'm really changing. I'm improving. I'm becoming more. Some guy the other day, like this kind of tough guy was like, man, you've been out there for a while. That's cool. Man, that you, feel you feel good. good. Yeah. And do you feel more connected to yourself or God when you're running or the universe or nature or anything like that? Yeah. I feel like I'm able to have some, or like my brain will have conversations that maybe I've been, been meaning to have or whatever. They just kind of show up while I'm running. And do you feel like you're growing by doing this running? By getting better? Um, yeah. I feel like it's not going to hurt me. That's for sure. Yeah. You know? And there may be some form of contribution that'll come out of it because, because you feel so much better, you'll be able to give more. So you meet at least four or five of your needs by running. Yeah. Versus the drugs made you feel certain. Mm -hmm. Did they make you feel variety? Um, no, that no. was the biggest problem. That was boring. Not dead, have any right? feelings. That's uh, you're dead. Did they make you feel significant? No. No. Did they make you feel connected? No. No. Did they make you feel like you're growing? No. Contributing to others? No. So it met one need. But when you get in the habit of it and you're numb, it's hard to shift. Right. So it's... It, the only reason people shift is they hit a threshold. I'll give you the chemistry of transformation. You see how it works for you. Okay. Like there's five elements that when they're there, people transform. So the first one that usually happens is satiation. Satiation means there's nothing wrong, but you've been doing the same thing over and over and over again. After a while, if your favorite meal was steak and lobster mm -hmm. and you have it every day, three times a day, there's going to be a point where you go like, there's nothing wrong with steak and lobster, but man, I'm satiated, right? And that makes you look around, what, what, might, what might I do different? but it doesn't usually make you change. It just opens your mind to change. Then you need the second element, and that is dissatisfaction. Now it's not just you're doing it and it's not as good. Now you're doing it and it doesn't feel good. And you start to feel that in the relationship side. Just like this, I don't, I don't wanna feel this way. Then that's still not enough. That makes you look more for a change. That's the second piece of chemistry. Wow. The third piece of chemistry is now you hit a threshold. Thresholds like you ever been in a relationship like way too long, <laughs> you know? Oh yes, yeah, brother. You, you yeah. knew and it was I'm wrong. Sorry. I want to apologize too to a couple of women. <laughs> um, yeah, but I should have. You just, knew it was wrong. You knew it yeah. wasn't serving them or serving you, but you stayed because it was certain. Mm -hmm. It was hard to change. Well, what if I'm alone? I was There's afraid to things. say certain things. Yeah, but if you got to the point where the way you stay is, you go, it'll get better. 
it was better in the past, or you jump to the future and say it's better. But there's a day we hit a threshold where you go, it's been painful in the past, it's painful today, it's gonna be painful forever, I'm the F out of here, right? Yeah. That's when people start to change. When you hit a threshold, you get the fourth piece, you get an insight. And the insight is what's really true, and usually figure it out, it's not my partner, it's not my job, it's me. What's going on in me? And you make a distinction, and that creates an opening. Like there's a chance for you to change your life in that moment. You had that when you were here and you couldn't feel anything with this girl. You felt dissatisfaction. You eventually got to a threshold and you finally said, wait a second, these drugs are just making me numb. I gotta do something. And you had to jump through the opening because you didn't know what was on the other side. There's uncertainty. A lot of people go through all that and they get to the opening and it only stays open for a few moments. If you don't do something with the mm. insight, it closes and you start all over again. You gotta go through all the time period of getting satiated and getting dissatisfied again, right. hitting a threshold. And some people just never jump through the hole. So I used to kick people through the opening. Yeah, you know? yeah, I've seen you a couple know? videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where you've done those. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so, but, that now, all right. but now what I do more is I, I bring them to the opening over and over and get them to jump through. Mm -hmm. So they get the muscle. Because otherwise, it might last a year or two, but it's not going to last forever. If you do it, you got a chance to make it lasting for a long time. But you went through that chemistry, but very few people do. Yeah. You got it's, dissatisfied enough. I'm thinking of some comedy duos who have gotten it done over the years. Um, Key and Peele come to mind. Faye and Polar. Um, Gillis and McCusker, of course. And what about the perfect duo when it comes to growing your business? That's you. And Shopify, Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch your own shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Shopify is there to help you grow. You know, I remember uh, when we first started selling uh, podcast merchandise, we were just selling stuff out of my apartment and then it got to the point where we needed help and Shopify does it right now. You can sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Theo, all lowercase go to shopify.com slash T H E O now to grow your business. No matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash T H E O is pornography causing a problem in your life. That's a good question. It's a real question. It has in mind. It has at certain periods in my life, uh, watching porno and everything and watching porno was making me, it was ruining my life. It was ruining my life, man. It made me feel just so much shame. That's what it did. Well, watching pornography has become commonplace today. And oftentimes men will use porno to numb the pain of loneliness, boredom, anxiety, and depression. That's why I want to introduce you to my friend, Stephen Wolt. Steve is the founder of Valor Recovery. He is a dear friend of mine. He is a dear friend of mine. And Valor Recovery is a program to help men overcome porn abuse and sexual compulsivity. That's right. Their coaches are in long-term recovery, and they will be your partner, mentor, and spiritual guide to transcend problematic behaviors. There is zero commitment if you reach out to them. It's just the first step in trying to figure out if you may need some help, if you can get some help. To learn more about Valor Recovery, please visit them at valorrecoverycoaching.com or email them at admin at valorrecoverycoaching.com. The links will be uh, on the YouTube. And again, there's no commit when you, commitment when you reach out to them. Um, but I promise you, uh, only something positive will come, uh, from you reaching out and figuring out if, um, if what type of help, if any, uh, could benefit you. Thank you. Are you struggling with keeping your website up to date and running your business? Well, a lot of people are, and now you can binge all the web design and digital marketing you want with modify. That's right. We use modify. They run our website. Modify helps you with unlimited web design and redesigns, unlimited website updates, 24-7 support, and digital advertising. If you always wonder, well, how do I advertise and how do I get people to know about my business online? Modify can do it. 
Plus, you'll get a designated designer. Consider updating your existing website and getting a new one. Visit modify, M-O-D-I-P-H-Y dot com slash Theo for 50% off. The last website you'll ever need. Again, visit modify, M-O-D-I-P-H-Y dot com slash T-H-E-O for 50% off the last website you'll ever need. Um, one thing that I think keeps a lot of people from progressing in life and stuff uh, is like shame, you know? Yeah. How, is, how is shame, it's almost hard to n- find, first of all. People can say you're ashamed of yourself, and I could, I could say that, yeah, I'm ashamed of myself. But it's really a feeling. You have to really... Yeah. And it's so like, it's like a, it's like a, it's so vague kind yeah. of, if that makes any sense, it does. but it feels like, like one of the biggest sicknesses of our being. You know, it, it, shame is one of the most negative emotions because what it does is it shrinks everything in you and it puts you in such a negative state that your energy drops. So think of it this way, when your energy is really low, you do very little to change things. Everything seems impossible. You don't respond to other people the same level. When you're super high energy, you've done whatever it takes. You're either excited about your future or your present or you're working on yourself or you're working out like running and you're that high energy, the same problem can happen. You can laugh at it, crack a joke at it. Yeah. And it's easy, right? So your energy level with certain emotions increase and other emotions goes through the floor. And when you beat yourself up or you have shame or anything like that, your energy goes down and then it's even harder to change, which creates more shame. See, I said I was gonna change, I didn't change, what's That's wrong? With, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? And then you start building up a story that it's something wrong with you. And what I try to explain to people, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken, you don't need to be fixed. I'm not here to be your guru. What you need is there's some patterns, some habits in the way you use your mind and your body if we change those habits, you'll have a different experience. That's all it is. But being ashamed will keep you away from that because it'll put the energy so negatively in your body and you're so wiped out that it's like it's impossible, right? And then when you're in a shame, you come up with all these negative beliefs about yourself. And once you believe something, what do you believe it's true or you believe it or not is true? Because when you believe something's true, you'll find evidence for it. Yeah. It's like, I'll give you a little test. Look around this room right now and notice everything you can see that's brown, okay? Everything you can find, it's a test. Look all around both sides of you, anything you see that's brown, people at home, look at that in your own room. What do you see is brown. Okay, close your eyes. Okay. Tell me everything you just saw that was red. <laughs> now, obviously, you saw a lot more brown, didn't you? Yeah. Why? Because you're looking for it. Open yeah. your eyes, now look for red. Look for red anywhere you can find red, any place you can find red. Okay. Okay, did you find more red this time? Mm-hmm. How come? Because I was looking for red. That's right. Once you develop a belief, you find what supports it. So watch this. You will find stuff that's not even there in order to be successful. I bet you saw some beige shit, called it brown just to feel successful, did you? Right over there. <laughs> I bet you saw some things burgundy and called them bread just so you could feel successful. I factored in some of those uh, <laughs> now and later. So you see yeah. what I'm saying? If you think you're, you're screwed up, you're messed up, you're gonna find and you're gonna color yourself that way. Mm. If you think someone else is a jerk, you're gonna, if you think they're your friend and they have a bad day, and they have bad behavior, you're all oh, they're having a bad day. If you think they're a bad person, then it's always going to be that way. What was the first part you said of that? If you think... Whether you think it's true, whether you think it's not, it's going to be true for you. In other words, whatever you believe is self-evident. You reinforce what you believe. You found what you were looking for. So you got to train yourself to look for something different. That's why I do priming. That's why I do immersion. Because after four or five days of thinking differently, seeing differently, focusing differently, different beliefs, you have a different life, a different experience. But if you do it for a few minutes... You know, kind of hard to do. So yeah, that's why I still do events because immersion has so much power. But some people do it through an audio. They listen to like an audio 30 minutes yeah. a day, every day, and they develop a new set of habits. Or they do it by exercising. Or they do reading a book and then they use it right away. So there's lots of ways to get there, but immersion is the fastest way. It is. Yeah. And you and that's the fastest method. And you use it for yourself too? Of course. Yeah. yeah. It's like going to that class. Why, why am I still doing that? It's like, because you got to keep growing. And every time you make a new insight, it stacks on all the other good things. You can stack the negative and be overwhelmed, or you can stack the positive and feel this tremendous sense of momentum. And that's the other secret, momentum. You're getting momentum right now, it sounds Mm -hmm. like. Momentum is like you've ever watched a team and they're getting their butt kicked, and then somebody suddenly does something magical. They steal the ball, they do something, and boom, it creates a spark, and then the other team takes over, right? Momentum shifts everything, and momentum comes by doing the right thing over and over. And after a while, it becomes what you expect to do. Or another one is certainty. You know, I work with a lot of great athletes. Those rings are from all, you know, that's from, uh, you know, I own some teams like the LAFC football club and 
the Golden State Warriors on a piece of them, the Dodgers on a piece of them, but I've wow. also coached them all. So those are all national championship rings that I've got. So I'm really proud of those rings. They're a representation of what I was able to build by working with these people. But when you look at the people that are the best of the best, they have certainty. If you see Steph Curry, you know what's for the Warriors, he makes those three sh three point shots from almost half half court, right? He releases the ball. He doesn't wait to go through. He turns around and just like he already knows it's in. Like yeah. how does he do that? Oh, he's a genius. Well, true, but where did the genius come from? He's been shooting 500 shots a day, every single day, seven days a week for his entire adult life and most of his teens. Now think about that. He's been in the NBA 15 years. He's the greatest three-point shooter in the history of the world. He made 3,360 something shots now, wow. three-point shots. No one even close. Watch this. 500 shots a day, that's 14,000 shots a month. That's 168,000 shots a year. That's over 15 years. Just his professional career. That's a lot. 2.52 million shots oh. he's taken in practice so that he could make 3,300 and be the greatest in history. So people get rewarded in public for what they practice in private. Yeah. Um, sometimes I have a tough time feeling proud of myself. Do you know what that, you know, and I think I've had other people call in our, our show that have talked about that, you know? What do you think it is? I don't know. I feel like, um, I almost feel like it's just, a, there's a disconnect. Like it doesn't even land on me. Or I feel like maybe if I feel like I'm proud of myself, like if I actually feel proud of myself, it'll go against some script that I've always had written or yeah. some, some thing that was always written inside of me. You know, it's yeah. like, it, it's almost like it wouldn't, if I wrote on the wall of myself, I'm proud of you. It wouldn't even fucking show up on the wall. What emotion you would know. you feel if you saw that? Um, like what emotion would I feel if I saw what? Uh, I'm proud of myself. Would you go bullshit? Would you say, be pissed off by it? Would you be annoyed? Would you just- No, I think I'd feel ashamed of myself for even thinking it. That's interesting. And it you know. produced an emotion in you just now, even when you just thought yeah. about it. I saw that flash in your eyes. It was just a little bit of water, a oh, little yeah. bit of fluid. Oh, yeah, dude. Fuck, we cry on here every week. Sorry. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. beautiful. Sorry. No, but, it's okay. But yeah, we don't, no. have any, we don't have any shame about that. No, you shouldn't. But I'm yeah. saying liquid le leaving your body in a public place as long as it's through your eyes is not a problem. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't ask, don't ask. <laughs> that's yeah. right. But my point is, there's a real anchor for you there. So let me explain it to you. Everybody has what I call an emotional home. Yeah. Do you ever watch like um, a place here and let's say, you know, where the cyclone happens every two or three years and it wipes out everything or a tornado comes through. Oh, yeah. And you see these poor people, all their stuff's all over the ground and they're picking it up and you, you could have a heart of stone not to feel. They rebuild. Two years again, it happens again. Two years later, it happens again. Some part of you eventually goes, why don't you move? You know? It's like, yeah. why don't you yeah. move? A lot of Vietnam's like that. It floods. New Orleans is like that. That's it floods. True. New Orleans yeah. like that. So here's, why don't they move? Because it's home. It's what they know. We have an emotional home. We have certain emotions that got built up in your youth. You know, I had four fathers. I had a mother that was pretty intense. And I had a lot of emotions that came out of that experience. If I didn't reprogram myself, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today because my emotional home was not good feelings. It's what I was used to. So even though it didn't feel good, you go there because it's what you know. Yeah. It's comfortable. So Yeah, it almost felt like I was deserting myself if I felt good about myself, which right. is crazy. I'd almost feel like I was leaving... I don't know. Yeah, it's almost like I know those feelings. No, no, finish that thought. I'm leaving what? Well, it's almost like I feel like I know those feelings of not feeling good about myself so well that I would be, I don't want to leave them alone because we always had each other. And it was like, yeah. if I leave them, you know. If have, I, you ever, have you ever had a friend? If I leave them, I just, I, I won't, I don't know. Does that make well, sense you, though? You, yeah, it does. You won't what? If I leave them, I'll just be letting them down. And they're not even... Yeah. They're not even real, but they're to part of me, some part of me inside of me, I can't even access. They're like his brothers. That's right. They're your home. Brother. Yeah. And by the way, I, I, I really appreciate you being so vulnerable because the people watching there seeing that allow them to be vulnerable because you're yeah. a role model of that. It's because you're funny as shit, but to be able to be that vulnerable is beautiful. But let me just tell you something. Those are not your friends, Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're not gonna abandon those parts of yourself. You're gonna find these other parts of yourself that need to be in charge. It's not to say that you can't have negative emotions or fears or feelings, but the ones that don't support you, you gotta break that pattern. And the way yeah. you break the pattern first is you start to see, you get a new experience. If I get you an experience where you feel like you actually felt proud of yourself without those feelings, and there was no sense of loss, and I did that with you for days and days, 
you'll never go back. Wow. Because your brain will go, what the F? I'm not going back to that bullshit. Those weren't my friends. It'd be like, you know, it's like having a friend that beats the shit out of you every single day. And it's like, I'm letting him down if I don't want to beat the shit out of me, right? It's like, oh no, I, I got to be there for him because I got to be there so he can beat the shit out of me all the place, right? Yeah. That's pretty much what's happening. That is crazy happens, right? to hear, dude. You're like, damn, here we go again. And so then you what know? happens though is the reason you went for the antidepressants is it's so overwhelming that numbing at least feels a little less. I'd rather see you cry and feel the pain even though I want you to feel pain as a brother. Yeah, no, I'm grateful to feel it. I want it out of my system. That's right. Yeah. But, but the next step for you is drawing a line in the sand of how you really want to feel. So I'll have people in an event write down, I, I give them like a minute. I go, draw a line down the middle, write down the left side, all the positive emotions you feel in an average week, not once a year or not once a month, the ones you regularly feel, whatever good feelings. The average emotions in a, pos in a positive week? Positive. So what are some ones you feel in a, in a week? In a week? Mm -hmm. Uh, feel, at, least, at least once a week. Okay, any emotion? Uh, positive, start with a positive. Positive. Empowering uh, emotions. Hopeful. Okay. Um, thankful. Yeah. Um, loving. Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe some pride. Good. And so so the pride, the pride is sneaking in. Now, that's not ego pride. That's pride of like, you're growing. Well, I'm learning about pride. I mean, it's like I said, it's really hard for me to feel proud of myself, yes. you know? So stop saying that. Okay. Because every time you say that, you're rewiring it back into your body over and over. It's a story. Yeah. It's like, there's an old phrase that says, tell a lie big enough, tell a lie big enough, loud enough and long enough, sooner or later people believe it. You know who said that? Hitler. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Fauci. <laughs> well, same difference. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know. Gonna be. We're aligned on that you're one, brother. Quicker, you're a quicker thinker than I am. But, but, but no, but, so yeah, we but, hear but, what we're saying. But yeah. you, the conversation you've said with yourself, you've done. How many times do you think you've said that? Said what? That you know, I'm. It's hard for me. I. You know, I, I say it. I say it a lot. Yeah, it's because I. Yeah, I think I'm. I, yeah, it's like having a new story for myself. I, I, you know, part of me is still, there's a heavy bit even to my whole new story, to having a new story, yeah. even having su some success in my life. It's almost yeah. like some of it feels embarrassing, you know? Yeah. And some people feel like, you know, the word people use is imposter syndrome. It's all bullshit. It's just fear that you're not enough. We all have that fear, brother. Yeah. You know, I feel that at times. I don't feel it much now, but I'm 63 years old and I've done a shitload of things for 40 years, you know? You built enough for, pattern. Yeah, I built up new patterns. Yeah. It's like a muscle. You know, everybody's got the muscle. If you use it, it grows. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? Yeah. It doesn't ever disappear though. It just looks like it's not there. But if you demand it, you push it beyond what it's comfortable with. And that's what you're doing right now. You're pushing beyond your comfort. You were settling for comfort to try to survive. Now you're like, F that. I want more out of this life. You know, I'm not gonna settle for that shit. But then you keep telling yourself the old story. So change your story, change your life. It sounds overly simplistic, but it is true. No, I love it. You I know? appreciate you saying it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of this chat has been about that. And then, but, but look uh, at the positive emotions you wrote down, or you just told me verbally, right? So you're hopeful, you have, are you playful or funny, or what would be your term around that part of you? Because I didn't hear that part of you, and um, I know it's there. No, I feel like that part of me became such my work that I haven't had as much free time to be that as oh, I would like on to On your be. own, okay, cool. Well, so those are the positives. What are the negatives you feel on an average week? At least once a week, not once a month, once a year. What are the negative emotions you feel? Um, ugly. Okay. Um, I feel um, incapable, okay. angry, um, and I feel uh, disappointing. Okay. So which, which of those emotions is most powerful for you? Um, the positive list or the negative list? The negative list is yeah. more powerful. And that's true for most people. Watch this. What's an emotion that if it became the dominant emotion in your life, one or two, that would get rid of those negatives like they wouldn't have any power over you. What would be an emotional state? Would it be like courage or would it be playfulness or would it be, uh, uh, let's say joy or would it be, you've already got gratitude, more gratitude. What would be an emotion that's so strong that it would get rid of the disappointment? Probably love, you know? There you go, and that's, that's your core, brother. I didn't hear yeah. you say that on the first one. That's yeah. all you really want. It's probably why you do this podcast. It's probably why you make people laugh. Me too, by the way. The only reason I do what I do is I love people and I love to see people happy because I was so unhappy myself and I got out of it. So I was so grateful. It's like, I don't, it's like, you know, I feed, you know, a hundred million people a year, a hundred million meals. Yeah, I'm I saw doing your that. charity, yeah. I'm doing, I've done a billion meals in the last Jesus eight years, Christ, right? Right, dude. That's almost, that's what, that's what McDonald's did, isn't it? <laughs> and it was free. They're pretty cheap at McDonald's, but dang, dude. <laughs> but I did it not because I'm a good person. I did it because I grew up and I had no money and no food. And when I was 11, somebody came and fed us on Thanksgiving and I was like, that made me believe strangers care. 
strangers care about me and they care about strangers. And so I fell in love with people and I want to make people feel happy. And I know what it feels like night food. I know what it feels like to be absolutely depressed and miserable and saying, do I even need to stick around in this life, right? So I don't want anybody else to feel that. So it drove me to find answers, not just for me. Once I found it for me, I wanted to help as many people as I can. But why do I want to do it? Because I love love. Because when you help people that much, I mean, I have so much love in my life. It's ridiculous. I get stopped on the street every day and people don't come up and say, oh, I like your show or something. Come on, go, you changed my life. Oh my God, I love you, Tony Robbins. And I always say, no, I didn't do it. You did it, but I'm glad I helped. But I love the love that comes from it. Yeah. So we all really want love, but we're afraid we're not enough. And you, my friend, you are growing like a weed right now because you're doing things most people never get out of. And I'm not blowing smoke your way. I'm not a bullshit. No, I don't feel. I don't feel that, yeah, man. You know? I appreciate you saying it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the been, truth. It's been. You it. got, but you got to you got to notice your progress, and you got you got to stack the good, and then you got to stop the old story. And the minute you start to say that phrase, bullshit, that's an old story. It's not true anymore. Yeah, I think a part of me is afraid that I'm going to leave a part of me like um if I you know if I even if I. Be successful. So, let, so let's investigate that for a second. Like if I be successful, I'm going to leave a part of me behind, you know? Well, then you're effed right now because you're already successful. <laughs> you got, I don't know how many millions of people I'm sure that watch your podcast. You make people laugh all over the world. Yeah. You have people that I think I'm embarrassed you. sometimes. But all those emotions are old habits. They're just habits. Yeah. So I understand that. And by the way, when you feel embarrassed or you feel these negative emotions, yeah, it also makes you feel for yourself for a little bit. So that's the other part you might be afraid of. Like some people like take what care do you mean of everybody. By that? Well, like for some, I don't know if this is you, but some people are so busy trying to make everybody else happy all the time. They don't take care of themselves unless it's a big ass problem. And then for the first time, even if it's a negative feeling, at least I'm feeling for myself, I'm feeling for me. And that might be what you're afraid of losing. Let's try it for a second here. What if I told you, you could go back and feel like shit as much as you want and it'll never stop. Right. <laughs> but you don't have to have that be the predominant emotion of your life that you, this need to beat yourself up or be ashamed or not be too happy, that it's an old story that got wired a long time ago and it has nothing to do with who you really are. But when you keep telling yourself, it's like my friend, I need to take care of, I'm gonna lose a part of myself. No, you'll never lose that part. There's a part of me that would uh, be a victim very easily. I was beat as a child. My mom was a beautiful woman. I'm not denigrating her. God, but when she put, but she put, when she put alcohol together with prescription drugs, she was crazy. And I was five one in high school, believe it or not. I'm six seven now. I tell I people the difference. I, I tell people the difference is personal growth, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I had a tumor in my brain that made me grow. But I was yeah, this I little guy, and she would slam my head against it. She'd put liquid soap down my throat because she said I was lying and I wasn't lying. And when the person you love most is trying to hurt you, uh, you can do a number on your head. But I look back now, and fortunately, I didn't let that stop me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't settle for that. I struggled for a long time. I look back on it and I can honestly tell you. If she was the mother I'd hope she'd been, like if I was well fed, you really think I'd be trying to feed a billion, you know, I've done a billion people and I'm trying to feed a hundred billion people. You think I would be spending my time doing that if I was a well fed kid? I don't think so. Yeah. If she had been the mother I want, I wouldn't become the man I'm proud to be. Yeah. So those emotions are not you. They were a part of your past. They were a pattern. It's a pattern of what you do with your body and breathe, but it meets some of your needs to feel, feel yourself or feel sorry for yourself or feel sad. Right. You follow me? It's like a self pity thing. A little bit, but what you're really wanting is not self-pity, you're wanting self-love. You just haven't learned how to give it to yourself. My way of doing that is gratitude. Because when you're grateful, love flows naturally. Is that a common pattern that sometimes, because I, I noticed over like a couple, about two years ago, I noticed that I, one of my biggest addictions sometimes was self-pity. I didn't even realize it. Yeah, yeah. I thought I was helping myself by like focusing on myself, but really yeah. I'd been too, I was feeling too pitiful. Yeah. I, I didn't, it was, it was, man, it was, I realized my alcohol was self-pity. Anytime well, I didn't. Also, also alcohol is a depressant. Mm -hmm. So what's going to do is lower, it feels good in the moment, but then it lowers your energy and your blood sugar, everything, right? Same for self-pity? Self-pity, same thing. Now your energy, think about it, self-pity. If you're in self-pity right now, zero yeah. to 10, 10 is total high energy, zero is no energy. Where are you in self-pity? Where would you put it? Oh, two? Yeah. Where are you when you're feeling excited? Um, Where's my energy? Zero to 10, yeah. Uh, my energy when I'm feeling excited is like a nine. Yeah. Which one do you want to be? I'd rather be the nine. Yeah, well, why the fuck want us just do that? I know. <laughs> Yeah, I think, but I think you said a lot of it is pattern. I think that's the thing. And a lot of people, I think you don't notice when you're in self-pity, man. I had no clue. Like yeah. I was still living a life and it was going well and it was yeah. going, but there was just a lot of times I was drinking my own self-pity, you know? And, yeah. and I don't feel like I do it a lot now, but there's times where I can fall back into that. So if you do, just like, 
If you do, it's like, oh, I'm going to self pity. You don't beat yourself up. You just no. go, that old pattern. I don't do that shit anymore. Let's get out. And the best way to get out is go for your run, do something physical, mm -hmm. or shift what you're doing, or focus on doing Somebody something else. for someone you love. Yeah. Any of those things will get you out of your mind. Because here's the biggest problem mm -hmm. all these words you're using are just forms of suffering. Pain's part of life. Suffering, you've heard, is an option. It really is an option. But what happens is when you focus on yourself, there's always suffering. So there's three things that'll trigger your suffer. Mm. If you think, three words, loss, less, never. If you think something you did caused you to lose or have less of or never have love or respect or free time or financial freedom or anything. Yeah, I think that's my one. I think I feel that something there was something I did that made it that way. Yes, and, and by the way, some is. people do the opposite and some people do both. They look at what other people did, what the mm -hmm. government did, what this person did, what some system did, something outside themselves that makes them believe they've lost something or okay. will never have something. When you think loss less never about yourself, the mind, you're not your mind. Right. Like It's like all the thoughts, you ever thought, I wanna kill this mother F, have you ever had that thought? Yeah, I don't do it, but yeah. I do think it. But you, but you just, the key is you don't do it. I don't do it. Do you think that's your thought? Are you the first person to have that thought? No. How long do you think that thought's been around? Probably since the Bible, I bet. Probably before. Yeah. Right? Maybe before. Yeah. So if I told you 100 years ago. Or Cain killed Abel in the Bible. That's why I said there. <laughs> yeah, that's good But point. yeah, and also there was definitely people killing each other before that. Before so. that. But, but check this out. Think about this for a second. That thought is not your thought. You're being used by that thought. I if I said a hundred years ago, there's going to be a little box in your pocket and you can pull it out and you'll be able to touch it and see people on the other side of the earth because there's invisible waves going around the earth and it's going to come <laughs> in your box. You go read between the lines, asshole, right? Yeah. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but think about that. Or we're going to fly to the moon and back. They used to call the people who said that lunatics. That's where the term comes from. People thought we could go to the moon. Well, we've been to the moon and you now have a phone that does those things. <laughs> well, thoughts also have been around forever. And think of your body mm -hmm. as like cable. Wow. You turn one channel and it brings down a signal of comedy. Another channel, it's a horror picture. Another channel, it's effing drama. Another channel, it's adventure. And so when you drop your body like this, you get a different channel mm. of what you see, feel, and tap into than if you're like this or whatever your state is or giggling or laughing and shit, then you get a different channel. So the pattern of how we use our body determines what part of the thoughts we tap into. Wow. But the biggest thing is if you're gonna be pissed off or sad, at least get a unique thought, one you created. Don't just copy everybody else, every other asshole that ever lived. Yeah. They're just copying it. Change your body, change your life. Change your story, change your life. So you've already begun it. Uh -huh. You've gone through the chemistry of being dissatisfied, enough to say, I'm not gonna do the drugs. Well, I'm gonna start to run now. I'm not gonna liken this feeling. But then you get pulled back a little bit because it's new. Your old stuff you know well. Yeah. And so you gotta just cut it off. And again, you could do that through immersion. I'd love to have you come and be at one of my events and be my guest and just have your own experience. But regardless, you can still do it on your own just by changing the habit, changing the habit. You change it enough. It's like the more you go down a path, the more it gets wired. They did this at the UC yeah. Irvine. They took monkeys, mm -hmm. they taped four of their fingers down, and then they manually bend their finger like this 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. Well, now they untape the, finger, the hands, and what does the monkey do? Right? No kidding. Well, you're not a monkey, but Many people drive to work the same way every day, get on the same subway, and one day they're supposed to go a different direction, get off at a different off-ramp, but their brain's so used to it, they get off on the wrong off-ramp. Well, that's kind of what you're doing. You get off on the off-ramp of some old pattern, yeah. and so what you gotta do is stop going down that path. Start to go, stop it, stop. So what they found, by the way, you don't have to do 10,000 times. So imagine they found they could do it with 12 of these instead of 10,000, get the same wiring. Mm. And the way they did it was they stimulate the pleasure center of the brain. So it's like, ha, 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 And each time they did it, imagine instead of one thread of connection between neurons in the brain, nerve cells in the brain, one, instead when there's joy there or excitement or pleasure, you get a thousand of them. Mm. So they could do 12 and get the result without emotion, right. you get the same result of 10,000 movements, right? Wow. So we wire ourselves, for, like you can, con so I have Train control over that, you're saying. Because yes. some people, you don't, they don't even notice it, though. That what was amazing to me. Was, uh, for years, I didn't notice that's what I was doing. Yeah, well, that's, and that's, that's the, part of growing, right? right? How old are you now, may I ask? I'm 43. Right. So, you know, most people, when you're, think of it this way. Zero to 21 is like springtime. You don't have to figure anything out. You learn, you grow, things occur. You might have problems and upsets, but, 
you know, it's, it's an interesting life. 22 to 42, mm-hmm. you're kind of the soldier of society. You go out and test what you've been like. Now, I don't know if I believe the shit I was told. Let me try this. You think, by the way, you're invincible. I'm the president of the United States, a multi-billionaire, and have 100 relationships simultaneously, and everyone's going to be happy. Yeah. But somewhere around 35 or 40, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you know, 45, <laughs> you start going, you know, relationships hard, and I'm not very good at this shit, and I'm not a billionaire yet. Well, what's the deal here? And so then you have to go on a journey, the hero's journey. You're being called to go into the unknown and try new things. And if you step into the unknown, you'll meet new mentors, new people. You'll Mm -hmm. learn to slay the dragon. You'll become the hero in your own life. But ages basically 43 to 63, that's the reaping time of your life. This is my rookie year then, This is when you're coming, brother. That's the stage of life, by the way, when people are the most happy, right, if they're healthy. And the very happiest is usually 64 to 84 if they're healthy. Mm-hmm. And, and people can live to 104, all those people 120. But each stage has different problems and different opportunities. So you're entering your power and it's showing up, right? You've got a large audience, your, your humor's become more playful, more refined, but now you're like, I want more, I want me to be happy. Uh, look at you know, you know, comedians that have killed themselves. I mean, we could make a long list of people that made everybody happy except themselves. Oh, when you all, yeah, people think of Robin Williams, Brody Stevens. Um... Those are just a few. Yeah. And there could be a bigger list. I'm not good at thinking of Belushi, lists. Belushi, all those guys. Oh, from yeah. Back, go further, right? Yeah. You know? So if you think about it, if you make everybody happy but yourself, I always mm-hmm. tell people, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Mm-hmm. And so you're starting to go, look, I want to be fulfilled too. I don't want to just be successful on the outside. I want, I want this to be inside me. Mm-hmm. And you're on the path, brother. The way you get on the path is you decide what you want. And you're going to decide, I want more than what I had before. Second step, you say, okay, there's a gap between where I am or where I want to be. What's getting in the way? Is it a fear I need to face? Is it uh, a habit? Is it an emotion? What is it? Is it a skill I'm missing I need to get? I don't know how to do this, so someone's got to show me so I can get better. Once you have faced that, then you get a little plan together and you start taking action, not a perfect plan. And then you got to slay your dragon. So you got to make the change. You got to, okay, so I'm not going to do the drugs anymore. Okay, I'm going to run instead. And then you get momentum. Yeah. And you're starting to get momentum. So now about. the only thing that puts the brake on your momentum is those old emotional patterns. Mm. So you got to go, that's not me. That's an old pattern. F that. Here's what I'm going to do now. And here's the other part, though. As long as you focus on yourself, you suffer. See, suffering comes from focusing on you. Wow. That's why, is contribution, is, that's why contribution is so valuable because when you're doing something for others, you're not thinking about you unless you're trying to do it to get something. Right, and but a lot of people had to focus on themselves because it was a survival mechanism. Me so, too. So they didn't have a choice. That's right. So some people, you don't even realize it. You, your whole life, you might be focusing on yourself and you might think, well, I'm selfish, but some of that might be just old habits because you had to focus on yourself to make sure you were okay. That's right. But then what happens is we don't update our software. It'd be like, right. use, it'd be like a using one of those old, you know, digital or not even digital phones. You'd be like, what are you doing? Are you an idiot? Oh, yeah, using a pencil. Yeah, I mean, what, what are you doing? Somebody's We're like, living oh, the this modern guy's world. A like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But you, it's time to upgrade your software. Right. And that's what you're doing. You're upgrading your mental software. Yeah, and there's some law. I think there's, yeah, there's a little bit of sense of loss with letting go of the old software because it felt like home. Yeah, like exactly right. And it's like, I, I'm old enough, I had one of the first portable phones. It was this Motorola phone. You ever seen it? It was like oh, yeah, eight pounds. Dude. It was like a buck a minute. And it, it didn't charge for more than 20 minutes. Yeah, like, it would just call the police too. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah. But I was so proud to have that phone. Now, and like, I meant you know, Sting too. I meant Sting. It would call yeah. him. Was he in the police? <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. If, if you give the, to make if you give, if you've got a phone today, they'll give it to you for free as long yeah. as you got a contract. And you got everything on, you got 100,000 songs, you got access to everything. So why would you go back to the old, oh, I kind of miss it. Okay, well, go get yourself one of those phones. Yeah. You can go visit it, go put it in some part of your house and go visit for a little while if you want to. <laughs> yeah. But after a while, you get bored with it and you'll move into the new stuff. And that's what's happening for you, bro. Yeah, once you evolve into something new, yeah, once you make a change, it really does feel good. It's just hard to make it sometimes. Uh, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one more secret. Mm-hmm. For changes to last, it has to become your identity. Let me explain. Mm. We all have a way of defining ourselves to ourselves. So, for example, if you see Lance Armstrong, right? He was the greatest biker of all time. He gets told that he has cancer. Not just cancer. Mm -hmm. Cancer in his lungs, cancer in his brain, and oh yeah, in your testicles. Oh, by the way, I ride a bike for a living. They told Uh. him he's going to die. But his core belief is I always find the way. So he survived cancer. Most people don't. He also found a way to win no matter what. He broke the rules to do it, and that cost his brand and so forth. But the same thing that made him healthy 
actually got him into trouble in the biking side. Mm. But before he used drugs, he was still unbelievable, one of the best in the world. And guess what? He got there because of a belief. So you have to have a new identity. His identity is I find the way, made him healthy. So think of it this way. If I set the thermostat in this room at, I think you'll relate to this, let's say 68 degrees. Okay. All right? And that's a metaphor for your comfort zone, your identity. This is, you know, that's 68 degrees is how much, not much money I want, but what, you know what I'm used to. 68 degrees is what I'm used to in a relationship. It's, yeah. not, it's not what I want, but you know, it's okay. You know, it's pretty good. It's what I know, you know? So think about his comfort zone. Now, if the temperature drops to 65, 64, 62, 59, all of a sudden the brain, the computer goes, hey, you're 68 degree or what are you doing at 59? And I'm sure you've experienced it. Like, this is bullshit. Yeah. And they're like, boom, suddenly the heaters kick on and you got drive and you go deal with it. You go lose the weight or you get off the drugs, you do whatever it is. But here's the part that most people don't understand. Let's say you get back to where you were and now you get new momentum and you're doing better. You go to 69, 70, 80, 89, 90, 99 degrees. And all of a sudden the brain goes, what the hell are you doing up here? You're a 68 degree. You're not a 99 degree. <laughs> and the first yeah. thing that happens is the heaters stop and you stop growing. Mm. And then if that's not enough, the air conditioners kick on and you start to sabotage yourself till you get back to where you believe you are. So cigarettes, if you, you used to smoke, right? Mm -hmm. So if I came to you today and I offer you a cigarette, what would you say? Yes, sir. You'd nobody say buddy or nobody. No, sir. No, no sir. No, no, sir. Nobody. Okay. You know, so why? Cause I don't want it. Yeah. Why? Mm, Cause I don't, doesn't make me happy anymore. Yeah. Most people, have, I, you wouldn't say what brand is it? Yeah. <laughs> you go, no. And yeah. the reason why is you're no longer a smoker. It's not your identity. Uh, if you thought you're a smoker, you might go, well, what brand is it? Well, maybe I'll have one, you know, yeah. whatever it is, right? It's like when people tell me, you know, I'm on day four of not drinking or not smoking. I go, why are you counting? So you can tell people how many days you last this time before you go back again. It's like when you change your identity, I'm not one of those. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So you are in the midst of transforming your identity. You're in the middle of it right now and you're doing a beautiful job. I'm not, again, blowing smoke. I'm not a bullshitter. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate but I, no, it. but I hope you take it in because you need to own that on your own, your own instincts have led you to a place of real progress. You're not there yet, not where you want to be. And by the way, when you get wherever there is, it won't be enough. You'll want to do more because we're all supposed to keep growing. That's what makes yeah. us happy. Yeah, I want to keep learning. I think it's it's important. And I like learning about why people feel certain ways. Yeah. That is like, uh, and so does a lot of our, our, our listeners. It's important to a lot of us. Yes. Um, uh, let me tell you why people feel like a lot of us. We don't, we don't get understanding. Nobody kind of explains to you what's going on yeah. while you're feeling. So it gets confusing, you know? So like, yeah, I don't know that I'm changing and I'm feeling sad about, you know, or just yeah. that. I don't know. Some of the well, stuff. But let me give you, let me give you and your viewers three things. Cause what I spent decades. <laughs> so many things, no, but I'm, but I'm, I will I'm, say you got a lot of things though, but it's good. <laughs> I'm loving them. I got, I got decades of <laughs> taking complex things and make them simple because complexity it. is the enemy of execution. If it's too complex, you don't do it. Right. right? It's exactly what I'm just saying. Yeah. It's too. So let me give yeah. you three. Okay. You, you can think about this for you and your viewers, whatever you're feeling right now, whether you're pissed off or sad or frustrated or excited or passionate, whatever, it doesn't matter. There's only three things that made you feel that way. Three patterns. The first pattern is what you're doing with your body. So let me give you an example. If I said there's a depressed person behind curtain number one over there and I'll give a $100,000 donation to your favorite charity, I bet you could describe them physically without seeing them. Depressed person, where are their shoulders? Probably down forward. Right. Where's their head? Probably looking like probably maybe something like that. That's right. Are they talking loud or quiet? It could be probably a little bit subdued maybe. That's right. Fast or slow? Mm, probably slow. That's right. And when they're doing that, think about it. Why do you know that? Because you've practiced this shit before. We all have, right? Yeah. But if you take that same person, and I do this over and over again, and you change what we call their physiology, the way they move, the way they breathe, you put their shoulders back, they breathe different. It literally changes their biochemistry. If you change that as a habit, you change the biochemistry on a regular basis better than a drug because you're not dependent upon anything. Second thing determines mm. how you feel. So then you're of, your own drug. That's right. And you're the if dealer you're, and the user. <laughs> that's exactly right. So if you're excited, what's the body like? Yeah, you're a little more pumped up. Yeah. Is smiling, your head up or down? Up. Yeah, where are your shoulders? They're there. They're yeah. good. Yeah, they're loose. It's, yeah. it's a different... They're doing but, what they want. That's right. But Is the fun. voice monotone or does it have more variety to it? Variety. That's right. Right? So you think about that. You're breathing more full or more shallow? More full. That's right. When you're depressed, it's more... Yeah, probably more shallow, except for some occasional big ones to get you, keep you down there. <laughs> That's right, where you let it all out and it's deflate, right? Yeah, yeah. So 
We change your breathing, we change your movement, change your posture, and your entire biochemistry will change that fast. Mm. But people have habits how they use, like there's 37 muscles in your face. This is the largest area of unemployment in the country because <laughs> people do the same facial expression over and over and they feel the same feelings over and over again. You change the body, you change it all. Now the second thing you change is what you focus on. So example I gave you, if you're thinking about, oh my God, they're not here, they're in a car accident, you're a worrier. If you think they don't give a shit, they did it again, you're gonna be pissed off. So whatever you focus on, you feel, even if it's not true, you will feel it. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is the language you put to it because words change meaning. So if, if I said to you, look, during the break, we have some nutritious snacks, the audience goes, mm, you know, if we got some delicious snacks, oh, interesting. Just one word change changes the biochemistry. Mm -hmm. It's not the words other people say to you, it's also the words you say to yourself wow. that change your biochemistry. And it's not just words. There's certain phrases that change what you even perceive. So I don't know if you've ever had this when you were a kid, but I remember, you know, I, I finally get to sit down and have dinner and I was responsible for all of making the dinner, doing it all. And then my mom or dad would say, could you get the salt? I just, I don't know what the salt is. And I'm not lying. I don't know the exact GPS location of the salt, right? I don't know what the salt is. And you know what the salt is in the kitchen. Go get the salt. I know the salt. You go get the salt. Fine. Oh my God. And what am I saying? Man, I don't know what the salt is. I don't know what the salt is. It's, it's over on the second shelf. I open it. I don't know. And I really look at it. I don't know what the salt is. It's not here. My dad walks by, reaches right in front of my face and goes, what is this? You ever had an experience like yeah. that? So here's the question. Did your eyes see the salt? No. Yes, they did. But your brain did allow you to perceive it because you hypnotized yourself by over and over again telling the lie to yourself. I don't, I don't know what the salt is, I don't know what the salt is. So it doesn't want to turn you into a liar yourself. Wow. So it's called a scotoma, a blind spot. So when you tell me yourself, but I don't want to lose those friends of mine from the past that made me feel like shit. And you do it over and over again, you can't even see the other option. Mm. That's why our language, our focus, and our physiology, the three of them together control. If you make a little change in your body, you'll feel a little change in how you feel. But for example, sound. Do you, do you like to sing when no one's around? Uh, not that much. Oh, I'm not a great singer. No, I'm not either. But when no one's around, like in the car, great song, something like that? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. So some people, they, most of us don't sing well. So what happens? We're in the car, we're singing, we're rocking, we're rapping, right? You get the spot, it's stop the party, light, you're still doing it. Look over at a car next to you, somebody's staring at you. Yeah. You pick up your cell phone, act like you've been talking to somebody or some shit. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? But what's happened is, <laughs> It makes you feel good to sing because you're using parts of your body you don't normally use. They yeah. lift, it lifts you emotionally. Mm. And so what happens is that's why even though you don't sound good, people like to sing when no one's around. But when somebody's around, they don't wanna sing because they don't wanna be judged, Yeah. right? So you can change your focus, your language, and your physiology. Wow. If you change all three, you make a radical change. So when we do like a seminar and you have the firewalk, mm -hmm. the firewalk's just a metaphor for breaking through whatever stops you. But when you get in front of 2,000 degree burning hot coals, you have a state change. Like all day, you might have found really good. And they're like, oh my, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I'll look at them and go, I couldn't do it either if I talk like this and put my shoulders like this. And I say, stand tall, put your shoulders back. Scream yes, yes, scream yes. And I wow. make these, yes, yes, I say go. And then boom, the person who couldn't go 10 seconds ago storms across the fire. Because what we do is based on the state we're in. And you can change your state by the way you move, by what you focus on, and by the language you use. Change all three radically again and again, you change your life. Wow. Honey, man, thank you so much for thinking about this stuff with us. I know that you have, before you go, we, I know you have a book that's coming out, The Holy Grail, right? Yes, yes. Is it okay if we pivot to that for five minutes? Sure, then, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah. So I know it's about finances, right? And yes. it's about the disparity in the world, kind of? Yeah, well, or, I don't want to. I've written three financial books. This is the third one of the trilogy. It's the fi fi final of the trilogy. Okay. And the first one was Money Master the Game. It's the most, uh, most read, most successful financial book of the last 23 years. I'm really proud of it. Wow. But as time went by, I wrote that book by interviewing 50 of the smartest financial people in the world and saying, how do I take this complex stuff, make it so my billionaire clients love it, but the average person can really use it. And it shows you how to go from nothing to where you wanna be. Then I wrote a book called Unshakable to prepare people for 2020. I didn't know it was gonna be COVID, but I knew there was gonna be a giant market change. Because you can predict that it's gonna come. We don't know when, but it's gonna come, and I want people prepared. And then now there's so many people unprepared for their financial future that they're in the hole. And so in order to get where you wanna go, you need compounding. Mm -hmm. With a tiny amount of money compounding, you can get wherever you want. Like, right. you know, if, if you start when you're really young, you're 19, you save, you have no overhead, you save 300 bucks a month and you put it, you know, let's say in the stock market where it's an 8% return, you can go from 17 to 27, and you put very little money in, right? 3,000 bucks a year roughly. Mm -hmm. But that money will grow over time to provide several million dollars if you stopped at 27 years old. You start at 28 and do it, 
you got to put money until you're 65 and you'll still have less money. That's wow. how compounding works, mm. right? So it doesn't take a lot. But if you could compound with a higher rate of return without taking too much risk, because you take too much risk, you lose everything, right? And is that higher rate of return still? So it feels like there's not as much, it feels very risky these days, or it feels like the stock market, like it's just a front facing thing to the public where the, everything else is done behind the scenes. I think that's what a lot of stuff starts to feel like. Well, and, and there is some truth to that because there used to be 8,000 stocks. And now there's only 3,600. And most of them, like in the Russell 2000, which is one of the, you know, the young companies, 40% of them aren't even profitable. Wow. When you look at what's called the S&P 500, the list of the top 500 companies in the stock market there, that S&P lists, those are the best ones. There's about seven that are represent about 80% of the profits of what's going on there. Wow. So it's a very small number. That has changed over time. And we didn't used to, people used to, in order to protect themselves, if you went to financial planner, they'd say, we'll put this much in stocks and this much in bonds because there's something called correlation or non-correlation. When things move in the same direction, if you invest in both of them and they both go down, you got nothing. If they both go up, it's nice, but when they go down, it's a problem. So I met with this man, Ray Dalio. Some of your viewers may have heard of him. Ray He's Dalio? Ray Dalio. He's the greatest hedge fund investor in history. He manages almost $200 billion in business. Oh, wow. And I interviewed him 14 years ago and became good friends. And I asked him a question one time. This guy's a genius. He literally manages money for countries. And he's got the greatest track record. Like 2008, when everybody, when the market went down, whatever the 38%, whatever the number, I forget the exact number, he was down 3%. Damn, you know? right. And by the end of the year, he made 9%. Good job, right? I mean, it's just brilliant guy. So I, I asked Ray, I said, what is the most important investment principle that the average person or a billionaire would want to know what's made you so successful? The most important principle. And he didn't even hesitate. He goes, Tony, I spent 20 years to figure this out. He wow. goes, I'm going to tell you the answer. And he said, it's called the holy grail, right? He goes, the holy grail of investing is to find eight to 12 investments that are not correlated. So let me explain. Stocks are designed to go up and then bonds where they are. If stocks go down, bonds usually go up. But in 2020, they both went down. 2008, they both went down. And so they don't, that doesn't always work. And so you've got a lot of risk. He said, the secret is if you can find eight to 12 investments that are not correlated, you reduce your risk 80% wow. and you increase your upside. There is nothing on earth that's more important. You're, you can try to pick the right stock or the right bond or the right piece of real estate, but you're going to be wrong. You're going to try and do the right time. You're going to be wrong. The one right. thing you can count on is reducing the risk so that you're right more often. And he that, said that that reduces the risk about the most, by eight to 12 investments? Eight to 12 that are not correlated. So what or, are some so, examples of just places that things wouldn't even be correlated? Well, that's why I wrote this book. Okay, got it. The average person thinks, okay, well, I got stocks and bonds and maybe a REITs or real estate. Mm -hmm. And the problem is even REITs often will go up and down with the stock market, right? So I've been around a while. I've worked with the best people in the world and, I, and I've, you know, I, I've done well financially. And so I get opportunities at times because I'm well aware of the fact that private equity, private real estate, private credit are actually much bigger businesses. For the last 35 years, hear this for everybody. What is, okay. For the last 35 years, private equity firms have done better than every stock market in the world, on average, better than average of all those. Wow. So for example, the S&P 500, the one that most people know in the United States that they you know, will invest in. Mm -hmm. If you put that, that's over the last 35 years has gone up 9.2% compounded on average per year. So you put your money in and it keeps growing. It's pretty yeah, nice. You're doing pretty swell. Yeah. But if you were an average, not, by the way, when I went to interview people for this, I interviewed the 13 biggest private equity guys in the world who run hundred billion dollars, right? Who make more money than, than God, basically the smartest ones Gosh. in the world. So to find out what they're doing, because these guys all make like 20% plus per year, not 14 and a half. So 9.2 versus 14.2. 14.2 is the average private equity. These are not average. That's 50% better per year to grow your finances on. Let me put that into what people understand. When you compound what that means. If you put a million dollars 35 years ago in the stock market, it's worth 26 million right now. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But if you put a million dollars in private equity, it's worth 129 million. Wow. Same money, same amount of time. God. Yeah. So it's like... So, and so most people know, they don't know that much, Yeah. but they know private equity does really well. And one of the reasons is your money's tied up for five years. So if the market goes up and down, they don't have to go sell. So when the market goes down, they buy, right? And they build, comp they buy a company, they build it up, they make it more valuable and they sell it to another company or they take it public. And they, when things are good, they sell them. When things are not, they buy. So mm. they've got a lot of room and they make money a lot of ways. If you put your money into these firms, they get 2% of your money every year, no matter what, for managing it. Oh, wow. Where they make money or lose it. 
So if they have a billion dollar fund, they make 20 million a year for five years, they have $100 million guaranteed before they open their mouth. Then they get 20% of the upside if they help it to grow. It's not uncommon for these guys to go from a billion to two billion in five years. That means they make 20% of that additional billion. They make another $200 million. They make $300 million on what originally was a billion. So when you look at the Ford's 400, the richest people in the world, and you say, are they tech guys? Are they real estate mm -hmm. guys? No, the number one are financial services. It's private equity. So watch this. This is mind boggling. Because this sounds like it's all for rich people. That's what I want to tell you. Okay, I'm just saying that. So you no, know, And you're right. And it has been. But here's what's changed. Congress, the House, just passed a law, bipartisan, that said the richest people in the world having access to this is not fair. Mm -hmm. And the argument has been, well, it's more sophisticated. Well, they came up with a way to do it, which is you made a minimum amount of money, money building a business. You don't know about investing, but you get to make these investments if you can get in. They passed the law that now says, and now House has done it. The Christmas vacations just come. They're coming back and they're going to vote in the Senate. It looks like it's going to pass there as well. You can take a test. I can show you a study for. You pass the test and you get access to these things. But there's another problem. Mm -hmm. Access. Because it's like buying an exotic car. If you got like a, uh, you know, one of the new Ferraris, not, not a standard one, it's, you know, one of the high end the Ferraris, there's a line of people waiting. They buy them all just like that. So it's not enough that you have money. You got to know the right people. So these funds, you know, as I got more money and I was more famous, I knew people, I could get into some of these funds, but I could get a sliver or some I couldn't even get in. They're already sold out. It was like, I was so frustrated. So one day I'm talking to my friend Paul Tudor Jones, is a partner that broke off and started his own business. And I was, Basically saying, this is so frustrating because these opportunities are so huge. I've got resources, but I can't even get in. Yeah. He said, Tony, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I'll tell you where I put most of my money. And I'm leaning forward because this is a big, big player, right? Yeah, yeah. Get the shovel, like, huh? Tell me, tell me. Tell me what it is. And he goes, there's this company in Texas that does something really unique. There's a few, but they're the best I've seen. I said, Texas? You know, normally, you hear Singapore, London, New York, right? Oh, He's yeah. He's in Connecticut. He goes, yeah. He said, Tony... You don't have to fight to become an investor in one of those funds. He said, when you are an investor in a private equity, they call you a limited partner. That's the legal name they use for it. Okay. The owner of the fund. And private uh, equity, just to, what, explain what it is really fast. It's buying companies mm -hmm. that are not public. Okay. Which is most companies. Right. And you build it. They put money in it. They bring a new CEO. They build a new team. They do new marketing. They make the company stronger mm -hmm. and they sell it. When you sell a business, you get a multiple on the profits. Okay, got right? it. So, so you're investing in those sorts of things. That's private equity. That's right. And they have funds that invest over a period of time and they do that. But so they're firms, not open to the public. Well, they're open to the public, but usually they're gone. If they're really good. Oh, they're really gone. They're gone right, right away, right? So he says to me, he goes, Tony, you can become an owner in the business itself and all those funds, not just own a fund, and you can get the same two and 20. Like you earn the 2% and 20. You'll make about 10% on your investment per year as an owner. Oh, wow. And you get all the funds, past, present, and future, the ones they did when it was low inflation, the ones at high inflation, the future ones they want to do. I'm like, how do you do that? He goes, I'm going to introduce you to these guys called CAZ, C A Z. They're based out of Houston. So I meet, meet this guy. It turns out 25 years ago, he started his career using my stuff and started this business. He's been incredibly successful. He's one of the biggest. It's called GP Stakes. You own a general partnership stake. You're an owner. Mm -hmm. You get the benefit of an owner and you own all the funds. So I now own a piece of 65 different funds. And they're not little funds. They're not billion dollar funds. They're 100 billion funds like Vista. They have 100 billion dollars. And they're growing like weeds. And I get wow. huge income like I'm an owner. And I get the upside like an owner and I get what an investor would get all the same. And then you say, well, why would they do that? Are they wanting to retire? No. Years ago, they used to just get companies and try to leverage them and sell them for pieces. Mm -hmm. That's old business. Nobody does it anymore. They build them. But they have to put their own money in too. So investors go, if you're on the line with me, I'm going to invest more. So there's a company called Bain that after 2008, when people were shaky, they said, we're going to raise $4 billion, but we're going to put $800 million of our own money in. That's kind of the standard now. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting money in, you open a new fund every couple of years and it's tied up for five years, your cash flow can be tight. So some, they want more money to keep growing. So if you know the right people, you can do things. So now I'm a part of that, but anyone can become a part of that. All the, it's, ignorance is not bliss, right? Ignorance right. is poverty. Knowing this changes the game. I'll give you another one. So people I, can learn that in this book though? Yeah, I explain exactly how to do it. Okay. And then um, another one, like all these rings, right? For years, I wanted, you know, I wanted to be a professional athlete. I wasn't good enough, so it didn't work out well. But then I was like, wow, I got to work with all these athletes and turn them around, some of the best in the world, you know? You know I get to visit with a guy like Tom Brady, go, you know, oh, go work yeah. with all these guys, you know, see what they're like and what they're doing. 
Well, I started turning these teams around and I started getting the championship rings that I would have. And I've got them here from hockey. I've got them here from NBA. I've got them here for all these. Kind of like your dreams came true in this all, all, all in a whole different way. way. I mean, how many people like Michael Jordan, a few other people have six <laughs> MVP rings. I got Who has six MVP. rings anyway, especially if it's a man, you know, <laughs> so unless they're Italian. If it's a man. <laughs> you know, unless they're 100% but, but they're Italian. Like, but they're cherishing me. But here's what I'm going to tell you. So then I was like, I want to own a sports team. You know, I finally got enough money to participate. And I finally, uh, you know, then they, they, take a microscope to you for a year to do it. It's unbelievable. And so I helped build the LAFC football club. I was one of the original investors in it. It was mm -hmm. great. But now there's a new rule that's come about in the last couple of years. It's specialized. And it allows you to buy a piece, even a tiny piece of multiple sports teams and be an owner. And the reason you want to do it is this. Sports is not tied to the stock market. It's non-correlated. Stock market goes up or down, doesn't affect sports. Sports have done well during recessions, depressions, player strikes, COVID, everything. They've still done well. The return from, from Major League Baseball, from the NHL, from the NBA, and from soccer, those four spots keeps growing. Has averaged at 18% a year in the last 10 years. God. So it's twice as much as the stock market, to give you an idea. And it's fun, but here's the best part. They're no longer just putting butts in seats. And they have a legal monopoly. They can, they own that city. No one else can compete with them. And their fans, their word fan comes from fanatics. Their customers are fanatics, multiple generations. So my friend, Peter Guber, he bought the Dodgers with my other friend, Magic Johnson and a group of other people. And no one had paid, he paid $2 billion to the LA wow. Dodgers, 2 billion. No one had paid a billion for a team yet. And everybody said it should have been a billion, it overpaid by a billion. So I went to Peter and I said, Peter, I know you're no dummy. He's my partner in business. We own sports team together, LAFC. And I said, uh, you got to tell me the secret because I know you're not dumb. You're not going to overpay by a billion dollars. That's a lot. He says to me, he goes, Tony, you know, he's made 52 Academy Award made movies. He's a total genius. So he said, you know, I'm not dumb. You're right. He goes, hell you what? I want to leave you in suspense. I'm going to make an announcement in two days. Then you call me. Come on over and we'll laugh together. So sure enough, two days later, they announce he paid $2 billion for the team. He sold the local TV rights for $7 billion and made $5 billion instantly. No way. Then Just for the a, soccer? No, that's for football. I mean, excuse me, for the LA Dodgers. That's oh, for the Dodgers, he sold yeah, the rights. Yeah, so $7 billion. Now, you also, when you own a sports team, the NBA, MLB, Major League Baseball, whatever, you get a piece of the ad revenue for every single team. Doesn't matter if you're big or small. So his local rights alone made him $5 billion. Wow. So you probably saw the, the gentleman he just brought on. Of the, Shea Otani. Yes. And Shea, he's, is that his name? Shohei. Shohei. Yeah. yeah. And he is. And I'm Shaw. Shaw. The amount of money. Shaw that he, Ray. The right. amount of money he's being paid is more than anybody in history. Wow. And how are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because they know that mm -hmm. the ad revenue they get from Japanese advertisers and so forth <sighs> will pay at times many more. Do you know, if you watch television today because of cord cutting, nobody wants to watch commercials. Mm -hmm. So 92 of the last 100 top shows are sports. Because you don't have, think about making a film for Netflix like a series. You got to pay actors. You know, all that's gone. You set up your cameras, you shoot. It's cheap to do. And people are willing to watch because it's live and then they'll watch the ads, just like the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. People watch all the ads. So it that business, and then they buy the real estate around it. They become media moguls. So now I own the Warriors, I own the Dodgers, I own the Red Sox, I own the Pittsburgh Penguins. Because you have a piece in. What? What I, which I teach in this book. It's a piece of these different businesses, these sports businesses, and it's non-correlated. And people can get story. into that. Shows you how to do it. Wow. And you can do a tiny amount, small amounts. Yeah. I'll give you one last one. Bonds, you're not, probably not very familiar with, because you haven't done a lot oh, of investigations Oh, yeah, they here. caught him. What did he do? Oh, not oh what are you bonds. talking about? No, I'm sorry. I'm talking about stock, stocks from bonds. Oh, right? sorry. Yeah. Yes, no problem. I was like, but yeah. bonds for years because mm -hmm. of low interest rates, have given you no return. So people have taken bigger and bigger risks. So back in 2021, you know, you're making no money. So there's a type of bond that is not very stable, it's very risky, and they call them high yield bonds. They're actually called junk bonds because they're very risky. <laughs> they were paying 3.9% in 2021 before the interest rates rise. Wow. And people were buying them because there's no other place to get income. I was making 9% on private credit. What is private credit? Yes. Banks don't loan to a lot of people. Really high-end businesses, $100 million to $3 billion businesses need money to grow. Mm -hmm. Well, where do they go? They go to private credit now. These organizations now loan you money. And they usually loan it 
you know, just a few years ago at like 5%, 6% for a loan. So banks are borrowing money from people? No. Companies need to borrow money from banks and banks don't do it. And Apple will get their money, somebody like that. Right, but a lot of businesses won't. There's 200,000 businesses in the United States between 100 million and 3 billion, to give you an idea. Right. Gigantic. They need money. So there's become a new market. It's these private equity guys loaning mm. them money, but they put their own money in it. So they don't sell the loan off. So they are really picky about who they put in and they build good long-term relationships. They have less than a 1% failure rate. No bank on earth has that. They'd be dreaming about that. There, though, you know, if you, I'll give you an example that maybe your audience can relate to. If you had a house and you had a mortgage that was fixed, mm -hmm. when interest rates went up, you don't care. You're still, right. it's only 3%. But when you bought a loan on a business, it's usually a floating rate. So when interest rates go, it rises up. So those same private credit firms that loaned you money at three and a half percent, guess what? Excuse me, five or six percent. Now it's 11 percent plus. The same loan with the same company and you're making twice or three times as much money as before. So when people are taking risks at 3.9 percent, I've got a one percent failure rate and I'm making nine percent. Now I'm in the high teens on wow. my private credit. And I own those firms. So I also get the two percent. I get the 20 percent. And I get the upside on those pieces. So those are just three examples. I give you right. seven examples of industries that you can do and show you exactly how to do it. And then the second half of the book is these 13 masters of the universe. These guys that, you know, like Robert Smith, who runs Vista, it's a famous firm, $100 billion in business. He started, with, he started with nothing. He's uh, the wealthiest African-American in the United States. Genius of man. I love this oh, man. Oh, hell yeah, that's and cool. He, he focuses on one industry and in software as a service called SaaS, but he knows it so well that he can take a company. Mm -hmm. He already knows what to do with the CEO, what to do, with it, how to grow it. He grows it rapidly. He's wow. got a whole system for doing it. He grows the business and then he sells it to a bigger company or takes it public. His returns, I can't quote his returns because you have to ask him about it, but they're all above 20% for decades, Wow, for decades. So think about what that would do to your financial yeah. future. What would have taken say 10 years to double you can do in three years. And so this isn't the only thing you do, yeah. but it's one of the most important things that most people don't know about, and it was never available before. Now it's available. So you're saying of because risks. of the new legislation, a lot of this stuff that's, is available. That's correct. And is there downside to it? I mean, there's risk with everything. Yeah. That's right. Well, le least amount of risk compared to bonds, less. Okay. But then the second, uh, other than say treasuries, on the private equity side, again, since they have your money for a longer period, you get a lot larger return, but there's less risk. Got the it. reason there's less risk is because when things drop in the stock market, they don't have to sell. They go buy then, right? Mm. When things are up, they go sell then. So they have more room to play within time instead of, oh my God, what are you going to do this quarter? What are you going to get the stock up this day? They don't have to do that. Mm. It allows them to make better decisions. Got it. Um, they had- um, By the way, we give a hundred, oh, my last three books I've done this, I've given a hundred percent of all the profits in the book go to feeding America. Wow. So while you're helping yourself, you'll help people that are really in need as well. Same for this one, the profits yep. are going to that? hundred percent. Oh, that's amazing, man. Yep. Thank you. Yep. That's cool, man. I, uh, I eat. You know, so <laughs> I know we're all grateful for that. You know, can I get a copy of the book too? Of course. I'll be oh, happy that's to sweet, man. Yeah, of course. Um, there's like, this is my last question. So there is, we're, we're kind of at a time in the world where I think a lot of people are under a little bit, it's a precarious time. It feels like, yeah, right. A lot and of some of that, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of some uncertainty. of that may be media influence. Some of it may not, we don't know, but there's just a lot going on. There's yeah. a lot going on and it used to feel like you could leave the world a better place, right? It used to be something that I think gave people a lot of purpose, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I want to leave the world a better place. And I think now there's sometimes feels like the, you're, the world has gotten, it's flared up yeah. and we can't do that. I'm not saying that's true, but it, sometimes it feels like that. And yeah. so I think that caused a lot of people to, it really takes away a sense of purpose at a level, probably an almost limbic or yeah. animal level that we don't even realize. Yeah. What can people do to combat that? The first thing I'd do is I would cut down my consumption of the news, turn off all the things that go on your phone, not to become a, a hermit or something, mm -hmm. but you got to remember that news people are good people. They don't have bad intent, but they have to do one thing. They're doing their job. Their job is make more money for the shareholders. There's only one way to do that. Get more of your eyeballs. Mm -hmm. How do we get your eyeballs? Upset you, anger you, produce fear. If I do those things, we all know in journalism, they talk, if it bleeds, it leads. Right. 
it used to be, again, a plane crashed in Nigeria, you didn't know about it. Now you know about it within seconds. So it's, there's actually, all the studies show there's less violence today, but we see everything more magnified, mm. right? We're also in a stage in kind of history, we go through stages. Uh, I don't want to try to be complex, explain the whole thing to you, but if you study a thousand years of Roman history, 500 years of Anglo-American history, we go through 18, 20 year cycles where we run an emotion as a culture, as a whole, doesn't mean you're gonna feel that way. So in the springtime, everybody's optimistic. I don't mean physical spring, I right. mean that season, mm -hmm. right? And things grow and it's easy. So like after World War II, we went into springtime. Everybody's like, oh, thank God it's over. Everybody had lots of sex. That was the baby boom, right? Oh yeah. You know, the, if, you were, if, if you were a veteran, you were like, you got to have a house for free, right? No money yeah. down, nothing. It was a cool time for a lot of people. Not everyone, but a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. The culture. Right. But then from 1945 to 1963, and 63 were the height of optimism. Kennedy's the president, John F. Kennedy, and he gets assassinated. And then Robert Kennedy, and then Martin Luther King. And what happens is we go through a summertime where everything's tested and there's fighting within the country. There's, it's called summer. It's like, it happens every 80 years like clockwork. I can take you, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really cool book. This is it Strauss Howe Generational Theory, right. is that that's it? it? That's it, you guys got it. So if you read Strauss Howell about generational theory, there's there's a book called The Fourth Turning. Uh, mm -hmm. I interviewed these guys. Fourth of, Turning? Fourth Turning. It's a book worth reading. Because what you'll be reading about how life is, and it's like mm -hmm. right now, and then they reveal that it's from 80 years ago from the New York Times. Ah. And then you read another one, it's from 160 years ago, and you're like, this is crazy. So it's a cycle that we go through. So after we're done with the optimism, we get burnt out. We go through the summer of test and upset. Then we have another good time. We have fall where everything's easy. You want a house? You have no money? We'll give you a loan. Right? Yeah, my you buddy. Know, easy, easy money, right? And everything's easy. Then that's always followed by a winter. Now, some winters are long, some are short, some are hard, some are relatively easy, but you never go from fall to spring. You've got to go through winter, right? We're in winter right now. So think about it. The people that were growing up in, try this for size. You know, most people don't study their history, but just take this for a second. If you were born in like 1910, what did that mean? Well, World War I was going on while you were growing up. So you were protected. You didn't go to war. You didn't have to face it. Your family looked out for you. It may have been a tough time, but you made it through it and we won the war and came home. Right around that time, like now, there's a massive technology breakthrough like we're mm. experiencing with AI and so forth. What happened? We went from nothing to radios, televisions, cars, planes, like, and, the roaring 20s. So if you're growing up and you're in that zero to 21, you were born in 1910, you're thinking, when I'm 1920, I'm getting a car, I'm gonna party. And the kids then were looked down on. They were called flappers, because they were irresponsible. It's very much like older generations often talk about millennials or yeah, Z generation. Because yeah. millennials and generation are great people, but they, they haven't faced anything really big. They think violence is words, right? You know, Chris Rock says, if you think violence is words, no one slapped the shit out of you on national television. That's violence, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a different thing, right? So, but when you've never experienced anything, you think that's pain, because that's your idea of pain, right? So they're right about that, but I have no worries. These are gonna be the heroes. Millennials and Zs are gonna be the heroes of the future. Here's how I know it. 1910, when they turned 19, and they mm -hmm. thought they're gonna go party, what happened? It was 1929, and the whole world was upside down. Suddenly people are jumping out of buildings, standing in food lines, the, the Midwest is a dust bowl. Stock market crash. Everything, so these people, had to get tough. They were weak as shit, but they had mm. to get tough because it was required to survive. So by the way, they do 10 years of the depression. It's not bad every day. There were some ups and downs, but pretty rough times. A lot of soup. A lot of soup. <laughs> that's a good one. But now they turn 29. It's 1939, and that's when World War II breaks out, and you and I weren't alive then, but Hitler was taking countries one after, it looks like we're gonna lose. Yeah. They fought that war and won they became what's known as the great generation, the greatest generation, because they face these difficult things. Well, at the end of the winter, it's springtime. At springtime, once we got through that, then we went through a hot summer. Think of how the 60s and 70s are so different than the 80s, 90s, or 2000s, right? Yeah. And so we go through these cycles. So we're in winter right now, and winter makes it look much worse than it is. Mm. But here's the good news about winter. It's gonna take that younger generation, and they're gonna become heroes. They're smart, they're connected, they care, but they're not as strong as they will be because they haven't, it's like lifting weights. You, you take a light weight and lift it, I don't care how many, you do 100 curls, you're not gonna get anything. Yeah. You take a weight you can barely lift and do, you can only do eight, eight curls and your trainer makes you do 11, and you, that 11th curl gives you 90% of the growth. We're gonna go through that experience, we already are to some extent, mm -hmm. but what people need is to create a compelling future. They need to know that 
this went, no war is forever. No economy is forever. No, you know, plan, pandemic or pandemic right, is forever. Don't get addicted to the story. Don't fall in. That's a trap. That's right. So you also have to have a plan for yourself. And you can see that, like, if you were the universe or God, after the night, you create the day. Yeah. You know, it's like, that, you get bored that's of it. it works. And that's what makes us grow. Yeah. And, and winter also gets rid of the weak mm -hmm. and strong. Not only survive, but they find a way to thrive. When you look at the biggest companies in the world, they're called Fortune 1000. Mm-hmm. 80%, excuse me, 70% of them were developed during a recession or a depression. Wow. Because when you do well then, you're gonna do well during all the other seasons. So if you start a business right now and it's hard, right. but you do it well, like I started my business during the last really tough time, which was when interest rates were 18%. No, uh, they were really that? 18%. You're lying. I'm not lying. Interest Today, if you, people are freaking out going 7%. Oh my God, I can't get a house. Try I bought my first <laughs> house at 18 years old. It was 18%. You're not gonna make any money at 18%. I lost money on the house. It was horrible, right? But that's what it was in those days. But I had to get strong. And here I am 46 years later, and I've done very well. Well, a lot of other people started when it was easy, and they're gone. Yeah. Wow. So that's good. Uh, it's a good way to look at it, man. I think it goes back to even what we said in the beginning. Just talk kind of about perspective, you know? Yes. Like, have a Need perspective. Have a bigger perspective. Have a bigger perspective. Yeah. Have a bigger perspective yeah. of what's going on yeah. in your own life. Um, man, I don't think there's anything else. Do you guys think of anything? I think we've spent a lot of your time too, and and we're. Well, great I really there. enjoyed this, Theo. Yeah, me too. And man. I really, I listen. I loved your humor, but I really want to thank you for your vulnerability because I you got a lot of people watching you, and you're you're leading by example. Now, not being perfect, I'm not saying you're supposed to. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. Yeah. But you're growing, brother, and and those emotions you felt, you're going to feel those a lot less as you keep on this track. Mm. And pretty soon, they won't be something you identify with. You know, yeah. it'll be like cigarettes. You'll be like, I. I by the way, do you feel bad about the cigarettes that you no longer are there with them? You've left yeah, them behind. I don't miss them. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to miss those negative emotions. <laughs> yeah, you it's never like I go like you know, <laughs> go like just you know do don't like visit a, them. Hey, dude, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> or use a Ouija board like to talk to a pack of Winston's or something. You know? Yeah, I don't do anything like that. I'm glad to hear that. But thank you, man. Thank you for taking some time and to uh, just help us learn about that because I think a lot of my listeners are really similar to me. And so I'm grateful for that. And well, yeah, I, hope just, they, I hope they join me because it's free. To help I have a God. Oh, yeah, and that's January yeah. 25th to 27th. Yeah. And um, all they got to do is go to time to rise.com, time to rise.com, register, no cost to it. And then it's about three hours a day for three days in a row. And you'll be blown away. It'll, it'll give you a new momentum for your new year. Dude, I'll say this sit in, listening to Tony is really, really interesting. <laughs> Even just being here. So yeah. if this is anything what it's like um, uh, at the summit, it's cool, man. So yeah, I'm excited about it, man. January 25th to 27th. I know my, my good friend Aaron Levy goes, has been to a couple of them. And, um, time to rise summit.com. And we'll put the link right here below, guys. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll that'd put be the awesome. link everywhere great. and we'll share it. Yeah, so. we'll probably have about a million, million and a half people will do it from all over the country, all over the world, 195 countries. So you'll meet some cool people too online too, which is kind of fun. Cool, man. Well, thank you for, first of all, just learning about stuff over your life, but also being willing to share it. I think, thank you. you know, when we don't share stuff, it's like it keeps things from other people. That's right. So um, yeah. it's been, I think a lot of people have, have, have been uh, helped by that. And so thank you so much. Thank you, man. Yep. It's been great. Yeah, cheers, brother. Now I'm just floating on the breeze And I feel I'm falling like these leaves I must be cornerstone Oh, but when I reach that ground I'll share this peace of mind I found I can feel it in my bones But it's gonna take